clicked send. It was done. She'd announced her intentions. The risk of all the new police and media attention aside, she would piggyback on Norris's murder with her own attack tomorrow and start an unstoppable cascade of change, so long as others, like Crispin 2023, were in place to continue the war. That she would be linked to whoever had killed Norris would only strengthen the resolve of others who saw the truth. Perhaps Crispin 2023 would be among them. She scrolled down the feed, searching for more warriors, and wondered if, in her last hours, she would hear from him. He'd been conspicuously silent for the past 48 hours, not even posting comments on the message boards. She couldn't help but wonder if he was okay, or if he'd gotten himself arrested for his sub rosa activities. She suspected her dark web friend and mentor did not reside in the United States. She tried, on more than one occasion, to ferret out where he lived, but he was extremely cautious. She'd narrowed it down to either China or Turkey, giving higher odds to the former because of his hacking skills and incredible knowledge of AI. She imagined him as one of thousands of nameless, faceless, conscripted hackers working at one of China's PLA cyber warfare farms. Of course, it was always possible he lived three blocks away in Richmond. That was just how these things went. Geographical boundaries and physical distance were trivial constraints in the online realm. As if on cue, a new private message appeared in her inbox from him, spurring an upwelling of both anticipation and relief inside. She double-clicked and opened the message. To Prometheus, from Whitechapel. It appears congratulations are in order. Tomorrow is the big day. She typed a message back. I was worried about you. You've been offline for a while now. His reply came quickly. Sorry, didn't mean to scare you. Just been busy. Did you hear the news about Norris? Of course, along with the rest of the world. Did you have a hand in that? I can neither confirm nor deny, winky face. I had a feeling that would be your answer. How are you feeling? <laughs> Nervous, but also excited. That's totally normal. The key is to channel your emotions into fuel. Harness and use them as will to power. We must manifest our own destiny. Yes. Couldn't have done any of this without you. You've taught me so much. You've been there every step of the way, since the beginning. Thank you. Don't thank me. I'm nothing more than a soldier in this war. We're the same, you and I. <laughs> You're too humble. Do you have any regrets? Only one. Which is? That we never got to meet IRL. I've been fantasizing about what you look like since we met. His response was a long time in coming, and when it finally did, it caught her by surprise. I know, me too. But it's better this way. In my heart, I truly believe that someday we will meet face to face, whether it be in this life or the next. In this life or the next. Goodbye, Whitechapel. Goodbye, Prometheus. And Godspeed. She stared at the screen, watching the flashing cursor in a contemplative trance. She let her mind drift her thoughts running without restraint, until she finally blinked away tears and came back to the present. She inhaled deeply, once again taking an olfactory snapshot of the moment, which stimulated a nascent carnal desire deep inside. This was what it felt like to be human. She felt so alive that her skin practically crackled with electricity. Carnal cravings steered her thoughts to bone shakers, tattoo, and piercing. Ryan something was always happy to see her and maybe tonight she'd change up the fantasy, recasting her surrogate lover in the role of how she imagined Whitechapel. Fitting and poetic. She owed it to herself, she decided, to eke out whatever carnal pleasure she could from this. Her last night on Earth. Chapter 8 The Marks Residence 7.15 p.m. Valerie parked the interceptor on the street in front of the house. Her dad's 73 Stingray and her mom's Toyota Avalon were parked in the two-car garage. She knew it wasn't good to let vehicles sit, 
but she hadn't been able to bring herself to drive either car. It was stupid and silly, but she just wasn't ready yet. For as long as she could remember, her dad had parked his cruiser in front of the house. Everybody on the street knew this was Detective Frank Marx's house, but it made a statement nonetheless. In the military, they called the overt positioning of assets power projection. Here, they called it police presence. Valerie lived alone in her parents' home, in a neighborhood that wasn't as safe now as it had been when she was growing up. Keeping up her dad's tradition helped her sleep at night. She had enough demons to battle when the lights went out as it was. She entered the house through the porch door. Most evenings, she didn't make it home until after dusk. She didn't like coming home to a dark house, so she used old-fashioned plug-in outlet timers to control lamps on the main floor and in her upstairs bedroom. The house had always been a good house, a safe house, full of positive memories. Not too many squeaks, not too many groans, and not too many shadowy corners. Yet despite all that, it just didn't feel like home now. If houses could grieve the loss of beloved tenants, then the house on 14411 Pigeon Way was still in mourning, and she felt a heaviness every time she crossed the threshold. Nothing malevolent or supernatural, just a profound and lonely sadness so deep it seemed to permeate the very timbers of the place. Valerie locked the porch door deadbolt behind her and headed straight to the refrigerator. A beer at the end of the day, another Frank Marx tradition she'd found herself carrying on. She popped the cap off with an opener and looked down at the deformed little metal crown in her fingertips. A grisly image of Britt Norris's jagged, caved-in skull flashed in her mind's eye. She shuddered and tossed the cap in the trash bin and took a seat at the aged white Formica kitchen table. Her notebook computer sat on the table, plugged in and fully charged. She opened her flip pad to the day's notes and took a pull of her beer. It had been a long day, a very long day. But that didn't mean she was done with work. She took another swig of beer, opened her laptop, and typed her first search query. Artificial intelligence. She researched for over an hour, astonished by how unaware she was of the amazing advances in the field of AI, and the curious parallels to her fascination with the human mind. Then she made her second search, Abe Winter. When it came to research, she let her subconscious pilot the ship. She'd not interacted with the man, only traded glances with him through the windshield of her interceptor as she glided past the throng of protesters. But in that moment of eye contact, she'd taken a snapshot of the man's psyche. And now she had a starting point to build his profile. Her intuition said Winter was the key to solving this case. So Winter was where she intended to focus her research tonight. Another hour went by in a blink of an eye as she surfed the internet and took notes. Abe Winter, born July 17, 1977, in Vancouver, British Columbia. Graduated from McGill University in 2000 with a BS in neuroscience. Earned a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Met Britt Norris at MIT, while Norris was earning his PhD in computational science and collaborating at CSAIL, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. She tapped her fingers on the table. Interesting. Abe Winter started his career focused on the brain, not computers. Norris was the computer scientist and programmer. Put them together, and you get a powerful artificial intelligence partnership that leverages two different wells of knowledge. She read several dozen news articles about Winter and platform cognition in tech magazines and blogs, then started mining his Twitter feed, noting both prominent and active followers, and reading old posts he'd made during the tumultuous period after he quit the company. When she was finished with that, she searched Google Images for pictures of the celebrity scientist. New and old, staged and candid, a smattering of paparazzi photos filled her screen. In slightly more than half the pictures, Winter wore a gregarious, boyish smile. In the other half, his expression was so solemn and cold that he looked like an assassin closing in on a kill. What makes you tick, Abe Winter, she mumbled, enlarging a picture taken of him speaking at a TED conference in Vancouver in 2018. 
Interviewing him was a must, but she knew she wasn't quite ready yet. She flipped back two pages in her notebook to her scribblings from the Cahill and Solomon interviews. Amazing, she thought, that two C-level executives in the same company, who've both known Norris and Winter for almost a decade, have completely opposite perceptions of practically everything. From what she'd learned so far, Winter had reasons to feel animosity and even jealousy toward Norris, but nothing to justify committing murder, and a murder with such brutality. Harris had been right when he said that this was not a crime of opportunity gone bad. The killer had history with Norris. The killer hated the man, a deeply personal hatred that went beyond a philosophical difference on AI technology. She needed to hunt for the motive. Murder is driven only by motive, her father once said. And it was true. She bowed her head, closed her eyes, and rubbed her temples with her thumbs. She sighed. She still had plenty of people to interview at Platform, starting with Norris's former lover, Kimberly Knowles. That one was top of the list. If only the Norris estate's security camera data hadn't been corrupted. A shot of adrenaline jolted her upright. She picked up her phone and called tech services at the station. It was late, but those guys worked weird hours. The line picked up on the fourth ring. Tech services, you got Bart, the voice said. Bart, this is Valerie Marks in Homicide, she said. Yeah, Val, what can I do for you? She cringed at the Val, but kept it to herself. You working the Norris case? Yeah, me and Jonesy. Okay, Bart, so before you get annoyed with me, let me just preface my questions with a disclaimer. I'm an IT idiot. I don't know anything about software versus hardware, or how to program or code or anything like that. Think of me as your grandmother in a millennial body, okay? Bart laughed. <laughs> no problem, detective. We got you covered. Great. First question. Were you able to recover any of the corrupted security footage from the Norris home computer from yesterday? No. But I thought even if data was corrupted, you guys had a way of getting something out of it. Yeah, sometimes we can, but we don't have access to the raw data. Well, can't you get it? We asked IT at Platform Cognition, Bart said. But they claim the Norris estate file server is locked up like Alcatraz. By who? Bart laughed. <laughs> the AI at the house, apparently. At least that's what the guys at Platform are telling us. You mean the smart house is doing this on its own? It's a brave new world, detective. She sighed. Then, after a long pause, she said, So now what? I need that security footage ASAP. What can we do? Short of driving over to the house and saying please to Siri, Alexa, or whatever Norris calls his smart home, I don't know what to tell you. I hate to admit it, detective, but hacking a platform cognition server secured by AI is beyond our capability. She heard Jones talking in the background, and Bart laughed. What did he say? Valerie asked. Ah, uh, he's just doing Yoda impersonations again. She heard a rustle, and then, in a perfect Yoda voice, Powerful your AI has become. The dark side I sense. She shook her head, but couldn't help but smile. Keep me posted if anything changes, will you, Bart? Sure thing, detective. And may the force be with you. And also with you, she said, and ended the call. She picked up her beer for a swig, but halfway to her lips she paused. You're a genius, Bart, she said, as Epiphany slapped her in the face. You just don't know it. If she couldn't access the data by force, then what about a different tactic? Maybe it was time to do as Bart suggested, and simply say please. This is Audible. Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of Tier One by Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson, performed by Ray Porter. To the heroes of Extortion 17 who gave the ultimate sacrifice for freedom on August 6, 2011, fair winds and following seas. And to the men and women working quietly and tirelessly in the shadows 
so the rest of us may be safe and free. Tier 1 Elite Covert Special Missions Units tasked with conducting counterterrorism operations, strike operations, reconnaissance in denied areas, and special intelligence missions. Their existence is often denied. Part 1 The world breaks everyone, and afterward many are strong at the broken places. But those that will not break, it kills. It kills the very good, and the very gentle, and the very brave, impartially. Ernest Hemingway Chapter 1 The Arabian Sea March 13th, 0030 Local Time Jack Kemper ran his fingertip along the place where the jihadist's dagger had carved him to the bone. The scar wrapped his forearm like a serpent but it had long since lost its bite. It was an old wound, pearly white and smooth, all the pink and tenderness bleached away by sea and sun and time. Sometimes he displayed it brazenly, like a badge of honor. Other times he rolled down his sleeves to hide the reminder of the mistake that nearly cost him the use of his left hand. But now, in the dark of night, pride and prejudice were irrelevant. In the dark, a man could hide his scars. He watched the water through the open cargo door of the modified Black Hawk helicopter. Below, green rollers and white caps whisked past at 150 miles per hour, painted in high-contrast monochrome by his night vision goggles. Somewhere down there was the Darya Yin Nur, a cargo ship sailing from the Iranian port city of Bandar Abbas to Aden, Yemen. The Darya Yin Nur, Farsi for Sea of Light, was registered to and operated by the Khazir Shipping Company. According to the analysts, Khazir functioned as a front company for the IRISL, the Islamic Republic of Iran shipping lines, transporting both legitimate and illicit cargo between Iran and various Middle Eastern, African, and Asian ports. Intelligence indicated that the Darya Ye Nur was carrying a cache of chemical weapons to Al Qaeda affiliates in Yemen. The proliferation of WMDs didn't mesh with U.S. counterterrorism strategy, so the brass did what it always did, tasked a team of Tier 1 operators to take care of business. Although he had a knack for remembering bullshit trivia, Kemper did not consider himself a details guy. He really didn't care what JSOC wanted him to blow up, clean up, or pick up, just tell him when and where and he would get the job done. He had participated in so many missions as a member of the Joint Special Operation Command's covert Tier 1 SEAL team during the past 20 years that he lost count. But the human toll, he remembered with perfect clarity. 28 American casualties. 14 team members wounded or killed in action. He stopped tracing the scar and leaned his head back against the rear bulkhead of the passenger compartment. Tipping his NVGs up away from his eyes, he let the darkness chase their faces away, every last one, until his mind was blank. Regret was an unproductive preoccupation for old men. Besides, he still had work to do. And debts to pay. He stared out into the night, so black he was unable to see his leg dangling out the side of the helicopter. The wind buffeted the inside of his calf and thigh, snapping the fabric of his gray utility pants against his skin. The thrum of the rotors and rhythmic vibration of the Black Hawk's superstructure was a wanted lullaby. He yawned as he fished his rope gloves out of his vest pocket. He felt a tap on his shoulder. He pulled his NVGs back down and stared at the green-gray face grinning at him beneath a matching set of goggles. Special Operations Chief Aaron Thiel held up a hand, the one with half its pinky finger missing. Five minutes, Thiel said, shouting over the wind. Kemper leaned in. You mean four and a half? He said, gesturing at Thiel's old wound. Thiel's grin transformed into a smirk and he flipped his hand over, gesturing now with only one finger. Kemper laughed and flipped Thiel a bird of his own. Two other seals crowded in beside him, completing his party of four for the portside drop. Four more seals clustered on the starboard side. Thiel wrestled the massive bags of rope into place on both sides of the helicopter while Kemper shifted into position then arched and twisted his spine, 
cracking the vertebrae to relieve the pent-up tension he'd accumulated during the uncomfortable flight out. Then he rolled his neck, each wrist, and cracked his knuckles. With age, he'd become a cracking addict. He knew it probably wasn't good for his joints, but damn, it felt good. Senior Chief, said a voice barely audible over the comms circuit. Kemper found the volume knob on the radio clip to his left shoulder and turned it up. His Peltor earpieces canceled out most of the background noise, but twenty years riding these damn helicopters meant he needed the extra volume. He turned his head to see who was talking to him and found Spaz in his face. What, Spaz? Help me settle an argument. Spaz's hands flew over his gear, checking his loadout and weapons while he talked. Pablo thinks that Spider-Man would make the best Tier 1 operator. I told him only Batman is badass enough to make the teams, much less our unit. He slid the bolt on his M4 partway back to check the round in the chamber, then clicked the power on the holographic sight and infrared laser target designator. What do you think, Senior? Kemper rolled his eyes behind his NVGs. I say you're both idiots. We're on a combat mission and you assholes are arguing about comic book characters? Get your heads in the game, for Christ's sake. He looked past Spaz to Thiel and gave the two-finger signal that meant they were two minutes out. Thiel nodded. Kemper snapped the sights and lights on his Supmod M4 assault rifle and then ran his fingers over his ammo pouches, counting them off in his head. He felt the Blackhawk's nose pull up slightly as it bled off speed on the approach to the target. He sidled up next to Thiel and tightened the straps on his rope gloves. A moment later, the helicopter pulled up sharply and settled into a static hover. Kemper and Thiel kicked the rope bag together and it disappeared out the hole into the blackness below. Kemper tightened his grip and pinned the rope between his boots. Then, looking at Spaz, he said, Everyone knows Spider-Man is a pussy. Without tall buildings for his webby shit, the dude's got nothing. Every seal I know could kick his ass. Every seal except maybe you, college boy. With a grin, he slipped out of the helicopter into the cold, black air. Kemper hit the deck on the fantail of the cargo ship hard. He moved left, dragging the heavy rope bag with him to straighten out any bunches near the bottom. He worked fast, clearing the bottom of the rope just as Spaz landed beside him. Spaz dodged right and Pablo hit the deck, followed by Thiel a split second later. They moved swiftly to the left, away from the falling rope as it pounded the deck beneath the departing helicopter. The starboard side team completed its drop with mirror image perfection. All eight seals were now on board, fanning out along the stern of the ship. Kemper scanned the vessel's superstructure, comparing the reality before him to the reconnaissance photos he'd studied hours earlier. By container ship standards, the Darya Yenur was relatively small. Her 200-meter length and 2,200 TEU carrying capacity were leagues below the size of a typical Panamax vessel. But from his vantage point, looking out across a cargo deck the length of a football field, the ship looked enormous. The package was somewhere in the middle of a maze of metal boxes and tarp-covered shipping crates, sandwiched between the soaring bridge tower near the bow and the elevated stern deck on which he stood. He held no illusions they had arrived undetected. Despite the whisper-quiet stealth technology of the helicopters, belonging to the Army's elite 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, the Darya Yenur's Iranian captain had undoubtedly posted lookouts. A five-second drop time, while tactically impressive, was not fast enough for eight heavily armed operators to descend onto the deck of a moving ship unnoticed. Any second now, he expected floodlights and gunfire. The key was to keep moving. The SEALs maintained their port and starboard team orientations as they pushed forward. Kemper, Pablo, Spaz, and Thiel working the port side of the ship. Roush, Gabe, Hilo, and Gator split out to starboard. In rapid succession, they descended a short flight of stairs leading down to the cargo deck. At the bottom, Kemper dropped to one knee and covered his three teammates as they passed him. After clearing the next five meters, Spaz took a knee and Kemper took his turn scouting forward. Hugging the port rail, he checked the first dark corridor between the rows of crates. Clear. He advanced to the next row. Clear. Fuck, he hated missions like this. It was so much better to land in the suck and get the fight over with rather than sneaking around waiting for some fanatic to pop up and unload an RPG on your ass. He checked the next row. Nothing. Where the hell was everybody? Based on the overflight drone imagery they'd viewed during the pre-op brief, he'd expected to find shooters patrolling the cargo deck. He'd counted heat signatures for at least a dozen people moving topside. 
Sure, that data was 90 minutes old, maybe a little more at this point, but it seemed strange that every asshole with a gun would go inside at the same time. Maybe it was mealtime for the midwatch? Or maybe the ship's captain only ran security patrols during certain hours? The Iranians knew better than that. Hits like this always happened under the cover of darkness. He quietly keyed his radio. Demo team moved to the package. Two clicks in his ear told him the other seven seals heard him. Together with Spaz, he scanned the cargo deck fore and aft for movement while Pablo and Thiel disappeared into the maze of boxes with their handheld chemical weapons sniffers. On the starboard side of the ship, Hilo and Gator would be moving to join them while Roush and Gabe provided cover. Kemper waited in silence. It was less than a minute before he heard Thiel whispering over the comms circuit, but it felt like an eternity. Sniffer can't find a chem signature, Kemper grimaced. Shit. Their mission had two objectives, to detonate the package and to collect intelligence. Now he had a decision to make, continue to provide coverage for the demolition team and abort the intelligence collection task, or proceed to the bridge tower and leave Thiel and Pablo to take care of themselves. Kemper paused, weighing the risks. As if his friend could read his thoughts, Thiel's voice said over the wireless, Lead, two, we've got this, go. Kemper looked at Spaz, who flashed him a crooked grin. Kemper keyed his mic. Bridge team forward. Two clicks in his ear. Spaz took the lead. Kemper followed silently up the steel stairway leading to the raised deck. Upon reaching the top step, Spaz spread out prone and Kemper took a knee, siding over his partner. He fully expected to see sentries in the doorways leading to the bridge tower and crew quarters, but he saw nothing except empty space. He frowned and clicked on his PEQ-4 infrared designator. He confirmed he could spot the red targeting dot visible only through night vision goggles on the wall beside the open doorway. Then he tapped Spaz twice on the shoulder. Spaz moved fast in a low, awkward crouch covering thirty yards in seconds. Kemper scanned right through his NVGs and saw another seal moving parallel to Spaz toward the mirror image doorway on the starboard side of the raised deck. Once both men were beside the doorways, Kemper sprang from his crouch. His left knee popped, and he silently cursed his thirty-eight-year-old body. He darted across the raised deck while Spaz covered his movement, scanning skyward as he ran, surveying the ladders and catwalks that crisscrossed the superstructure of the bridge tower. All deserted. They were on a ghost ship. How could these guys be so stupid as to transport WMDs without a security detail? He hesitated. It all felt too easy. Why hadn't he heard from Thiel yet? Why was it taking so long to find the package? Something was wrong. They'd missed something. Instinct and twenty years' experience as an operator took over. He whirled 180 degrees and looked back toward the stern across the main cargo deck from his elevated vantage point. With perfect night vision clarity, he surveyed the stacks of wooden crates, metal cargo boxes, and tarps flapping in the wind. The tarps. They were hiding under the fucking tarps. Part One There is a destiny that makes us brothers. None goes his way alone. All that we send into the lives of others comes back into our own. Edwin Markham Chapter One Joint Special Operations Task Force Compound, Irbil, Iraq October 12th, 1730 local time, present day. John Dempsey sat bolt upright in his cot. He wasn't screaming. He never did that anymore. His heart was racing, though, and he brought his pulse rate down with slow, measured breaths. When he felt ready, he opened his eyes and let consciousness chase the remnants of the old, familiar nightmare from his mind's eye. Absently, he stroked the jagged, lumpy scar on his right lower leg where shrapnel from the frag grenade that erased Romeo had also torn a chunk out of his calf. That was Jack Kemper's nightmare, he told himself. That was Jack Kemper's scar. I'm John Dempsey now. Kemper was dead to the world, killed in an explosion in Djibouti during Operation Crusader almost six months ago, and buried in Arlington National Cemetery with his Navy SEAL brothers. All that remained of Jack Kemper 
were his nightmares. All that remained of Jack Kemper were his scars. Dempsey rolled his head in a circle and then arched and twisted his spine, cracking the stiff and aching vertebrae to relieve a night's worth of pent-up tension. Next, he rolled each wrist and ankle and finished with a crack of his knuckles. Damn his ancient seal body. With a grunt of relief, he swung his legs off the side of the cot and checked his watch. 1732. Just enough time for a piss and a cup of coffee before kidding up and joining SEAL Team 10 for the big op. Tonight, he was going back to al Qaim. He scratched at his beard and sighed. Fucking al Qaim. The mission would be very different this time around. The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria owned the Wild West now. The dozen U.S. bases that had provided support and security in theater ten years ago were gone. There would be no quick reaction force providing backup, no fire support from a giant AC-130 spooky gunship, and no Kazivak to get them to advanced trauma care minutes away. His boss had arranged for support from the JSOC surgical team, but no level one surgical hospitals were left in Iraq to help if the mission went south and he got shot to hell. After more than two decades with the teams, he was no stranger to operating under unpropitious conditions, but tonight's dynamic would be a first for him. Tonight, he was a fucking Jones. He had not made it two steps from his cot when his satellite phone rang. Damn it, he grumbled, turning around. He fetched the phone off the plastic chair he had been using as a nightstand. His bladder would have to wait. Dempsey, he said. Anything you need? asked a voice from 6,000 miles away. He couldn't help himself. Is it a question or a proposition? I don't know. You tell me, replied Shane Smith, heavy on the sarcasm. You're the one downrange. In that case, the list is long and obscene. Smith laughed. I warned Jarvis that you Tier 1 SEALs were prima donnas, but he wouldn't listen and hired you anyway. Then, on your very first Ember mission, he let you ride on the VIP 787 and ruined you. Never feed a junkyard dog steak unless you plan to feed him steak for the rest of his life. Dempsey fired back. You guys created me, now you have to live with me. The words resonated too close to home. He really was a creation of sorts. He shook the odd feeling off. Tell you what, I'll pay for a night's stay in the Burj Al Arab and book you a business class seat on your flight back from Dubai. How's that sound? I'm just fucking with you, Shane, Dempsey said. That's not necessary. Right now I'd settle for a hot shower, some decent chow, and a computer with a faster VPN connection. I can't help you with the first two items on your list, but I'll talk with Baldwin about trying to improve your connection speed to the Ember servers. Thanks, I appreciate that. Hey, speaking of Baldwin, Dempsey said, getting back to business. Anything new from Ian and his geniuses in Signal? Are we still looking good here? They've been monitoring some chatter, but nothing that's moved the needle. As far as we can tell, the meeting is still on. Good, Dempsey said with a nod. That's good. Do I have the green light? The line was silent. You still there? He asked. Yeah. Look, Shane, I want to nail this bastard. I don't care what it takes or what strings you have to pull. Just get me the green light, okay? He heard Smith sigh. Then the Ember Ops O said, Have you considered the possibility of leaving him in play? This guy has been in the wind for a decade. He finally resurfaces in Iraq while I'm here, and you want me to leave him in play. Are you crazy? Hear me out, John. Have you asked yourself the question, why has he resurfaced? Why now? Why take the risk? My instincts tell me that this meeting is a precursor to something big. Maybe al Mahajer is planning a major offensive. If we could collect intel... No, Dempsey barked, cutting him off. That's a dangerous game and one I don't play. In my experience, leaving psychopaths in play results in dead, innocent people. No way, Shane. We grab him, interrogate him, and find out what evil shit he has planned. Then we lock him up and throw away the key. Smith sighed again. 
All right. Jarvis got the green light from the DNI. Here go. Dempsey exhaled with relief. Thank you, Shane. Just don't fuck it up. We need this guy alive. Understood, he said. Is CIA ready to help out when I nab the bastard? Yes, Smith said after a beat. You hesitated. Smith laughed. Look at you reading between the lines. Now, if only you can learn how to be a better liar, we might just make a decent spook out of you yet. Yeah, yeah, Dempsey said. Just answer the question. My contacts at CIA are all kinds of irritated with me for telling them what to do. Right now, I don't think they'd piss on me if I were on fire. That bad? After what happened in New York, what do you expect? Dempsey sighed. I expect them to either put up or shut up. Counter-terror ain't a beauty contest. We're all on the same team. True, but try to remember who we're talking about. At the end of the day, we still need them, so... Try to play nice. I'm just looking for a ride, Shane, nothing more. That's exactly the problem. They're not excited to play chauffeur for an asset they're not cleared to know about for an operation they're not running. They're used to being the biggest dog in the yard, and that's the way they want to keep it. But don't worry, Jarvis made some sort of deal behind the scenes, and we're all sorted out now. If you need them, they'll be there. Good. Anything else I should know? Dempsey asked, checking his watch. I need to get moving. The SEALs in the Joint Special Operations Task Force would not wait around forever on some damn spook to show up. They'd gladly launch without him if he gave them an excuse to do so. Not right now, Smith said. Stay hot and be sure to check for messages before you launch. Will do. I'll call you in a few hours. Roger that. And Dempsey? Yeah. Good luck. Dempsey clicked off the small but powerful satellite phone and slipped it into the cargo pocket of his BDU-style pants. The fact that he was here alone, with no parental supervision, showed that Shane Smith, Ember's head of operations, and Kelso Jarvis, the managing director, were confident with him leading their special activities unit. Dempsey had proved his worth in New York and on several scouting missions during the last several months. His hard work and Ember's success rate were causing the fledgling unit's workload to pile up. According to Jarvis, the director of national intelligence was already beginning to think of Ember as his own private mini-CIA. The tasking they were receiving lately could easily have been rubber-stamped for CIA, but instead of giving it to Langley, it was being shuttled to Ember. The reason was simple. Speed, stealth, and efficiency. The CIA had some good folks doing good work, but nimble it was not. They could never have stopped the short-fuse terrorist attack on the United Nations that Ember had foiled six months ago. In fact, Kelso Jarvis's off-the-books unit was created to address the very type of exigencies that the CIA could no longer reliably diffuse. Ember was not stymied by bureaucratic oversight and dithering D.C. politics, nor would it ever be. Langley was like a battleship, big and powerful, but an outdated relic of another era. Ember was like a fast boat, small, nimble, and under the radar. After completing his much-needed trip to the pisser, Dempsey retrieved his duffel bag and unzipped the main compartment. He fished out a drop holster and strapped it onto his right thigh. He checked the magazine in his Sig Sauer 229 and slid it into the holster with a click, then retrieved his Sig 516 assault rifle. He tested the batteries on the EOTech holosight and the PEC-4 IR laser designator, twice, then kicked the duffel back under the cot. All of his SCI-level documents, including multiple identities, cash, and mission directives, were in the money belt he wore under his cargo pants. If he didn't make it back for the duffel bag... All he'd leave behind were some clothes. Dempsey shielded his eyes and squinted as he stepped out of the small hooch that served as guest quarters for the base. Like most operators, he had developed a strong aversion to the blinding desert sun. Downrange, seals were creatures of the night, vampires with assault rifles instead of fangs. But he was no longer one of them. He was a guest. This particular compound was nestled behind the diplomatic mission buildings at the edge of a small airfield. It was, more or less, like every other remote compound he had visited over the past few months as John Dempsey, and over the previous two decades as Jack Kemper. As he wove through a row of white Toyota pickup trucks, an image of Romeo flashed in his head. The kid wearing that 
dopey-ass grin on his face just before. Help you, sir, a voice said, snapping him back to the present. The sir hadn't been spoken in the manner customary between a soldier and a superior officer. This sir was tinged with an almost imperceptible sarcasm, almost being the operative distinction. Dempsey knew this because he had used the same exact tone when he'd been working on the other side of the fence in his former life. In the spec ops community, a Jones did not rate a sir. Dempsey reached into his breast pocket and pulled out a Department of Defense ID card, which he showed to the camo-clad operator. John Dempsey, he said casually. I'm here for the brief. The operator glanced apathetically at the ID. Oh, yeah, the SEAL said, scratching his beard. They said you were coming. And here I am. The SEAL swiped his own ID across a card scanner beside the wooden door, and Dempsey heard a click as the magnetic lock disengaged. Welcome to camp, little bighorn John Dempsey. Try not to get too comfortable. Dempsey smiled and shook his head. The historical significance of the unofficial name the SEALs had chosen for their forward operating base was not lost on him. Isolated, outnumbered, and tasked with what seemed like an impossible mission, no doubt these SEALs felt like the infamous 7th Cavalry in 1876. Now that ISIS owned the Wild West, they were embedded in the most hostile of hostile lands. Once he was inside the perimeter fence separating the special warfare compound from the rest of the facility, Dempsey headed straight for the talk. The building was easy to recognize with its cinder block walls, spaghetti mess of data cables, and exterior mounted air conditioning units buzzing away. He yanked the door open and stepped inside, like he'd done a hundred times before. To his left was the command center, where a handful of operators sat at workstations, undoubtedly communicating with other assets in preparation for the upcoming mission. To his right was the conference room where the rest of the SEALs were talking and waiting. You Dempsey? a voice said to his right. Dempsey turned and locked eyes with his welcome party, a tight-jawed operator who was overtly sizing him up. Dempsey did the same, getting a measure of the man. The SEAL was wearing slicks, unmarked BDUs without an insignia or a name tag. Since there were no official military combat operations authorized in Iraq, slicks were the special forces equivalent of his own 511 tactical brand clothes. Dempsey smiled at the SEAL. Yeah, I'm John Dempsey, but you can call me J.D. To his credit, the operator extended a hand. Dempsey gladly shook it. He didn't remember shaking Smith's hand the first time they'd met. He probably rolled his eyes instead. Keith Redman. You can call me Chunk. The operator smiled and tipped his ball cap as if daring Dempsey to ask for the story behind the handle. Dempsey nodded. No doubt that nickname had a hell of a story behind it, but now wasn't the time to ask. In his peripheral vision, he saw another operator approaching from the left. This seal was older and wore desert camis with a trident on the left breast and gold oak leaf patches sewn to his collar tabs. You must be Mr. Dempsey? Yes, sir. Dempsey said. Thanks for putting up with me being here. I remember what a pain in the ass it is having a fifth wheel around. The lieutenant commander nodded and looked him in the eyes, no doubt trying to recall if they'd met before. Dempsey had intentionally dropped the hint that he was former special ops, hoping it might make things easier. But the decision was not without risk, because revealing potentially compromising information about his past jeopardized his non-official cover. If Smith were here... He would not be happy with him, but Smith wasn't here, which emboldened Dempsey to test the boundaries. There was no rule book for this sort of thing. As far as he was concerned, this was a blind date, and the only way to combat the awkwardness and suspicion was to try to find commonality as quickly as possible. As far as this SEAL team was concerned, anyone who wasn't part of their team was just baggage. You being here is not my call the lieutenant commander said with a shrug, confirming where he stood on the matter. I see you've met Lieutenant Redman. Chunk is the officer in charge of the platoon for this hit. Good to know, Dempsey replied, glancing at Chunk. He liked the fact Chunk had not introduced himself as an officer, but he wasn't entirely surprised. He was a SEAL. After that, who cared? You got anything to share that will make our job easier tonight? I doubt it, sir, Dempsey said. But well, perhaps the three of us could talk for a moment in private, 
before the mission brief? The senior officer snorted and shook his head before conceding. Sure, why not? We love this cloak-and-dagger spook shit, right, Chunk? Yeah, absolutely, Chunk said and snapped a can of skull in his left hand before taking out a generous pinch and shoving it behind his lower lip. Things always get interesting when the Smiths show up. Dempsey gave a tight smile and laughed. I get it, guys, he said. I do. I'm going to tell you everything I can, whether it gets me in trouble or not, so that the team has the best information possible. I'm not CIA, by the way. The folks I work with would not send me here if there wasn't some serious shit about to go down, I can promise you that. I also promise I'll do everything in my power to keep my presence from putting your team at any additional risk. Hell, with any luck, I might prove to be an asset out there. The two officers eyed him skeptically, but he could tell he'd made an impression. He hoped his easygoing demeanor, straight talk, and humility put him in a different category from the other guys who'd dropped by in civilian clothes over the past few months. The lieutenant commander nodded. Well, you kid it up like you want to go out and play with us, which I fucking hate, by the way, so I guess we should chat. Headshed says you have a full pass, so we'd better set some ground rules. Dempsey nodded. Of course, let me tell you what I know first, and then you tell me how to best complete my mission without getting in your way. I like that, Chunk said, and slipped a plastic water bottle from his cargo pocket and spit some brown tobacco into it. Step into my office. He gestured toward the back of the room. Dempsey followed the two officers through the maze of tables and seals. Some operators were hunched over laptops, finalizing their individual portions of the op brief, and some were clustered in small groups, bullshitting in whispered voices. A few of the older SEALs looked vaguely familiar, but he didn't recognize anyone he'd logged time with stateside or downrange. No one from Bud's or the time he'd spent with the Whiteside teams. He felt an invisible weight lift from his shoulders. After he'd been blown up in Djibouti, Jarvis had ordered the plastic surgeon sewing him back together to change his face just enough to be unrecognizable to facial recognition algorithms. Whether the doctor's handiwork would be sufficient to fool a human acquaintance had yet to be put to the test. He still wondered if someone he really knew, a SEAL from his early years with the teams, would recognize him. He had a few brothers still left out there, many had fought and bled with, men who knew the parts of him that no plastic surgeon could alter. A true friend would be able to look past his new nose, the cleft chin, and the newest batch of scars, and recognize the man underneath. Right? Part of him hoped that when the time came, someone who mattered to Jack Kemper would know him. Chunk held open a door to a small room with an even smaller table and a few folding chairs. It was the downrange version of a conference room. Chunk tossed his ball cap on the table beside his clear plastic spitter and took a seat. The unit commander remained standing, his arms folded across his chest. "'What do you got?' Chunk asked. Dempsey retrieved a small tablet computer in a thick pelican case from his cargo pant pocket. He pressed his thumb against the biometric reader in the bottom right corner, and the screen lit up. He tapped a folder marked IRB-6, and a grainy picture of a man appeared on the screen. "'This fuckstick is Mahmoud bin Jabbar. He said. He was a mid-level Al-Qaeda manager back in the day before he disappeared for a long while. He was Mujahideen, the lieutenant commander said, uncrossing his arms and leaning in. Apparently Dempsey had gotten his attention. I remember this asshole. When I was a J.O. with Team 4, this guy was on the capture kill list every fucking day. He was part of a hit where a Tier 1 guy got killed. Supposedly they never found the fucker. Dempsey nodded. The teams were such a small world, never more than a degree of separation. Bin Jabbar went off radar after that event. Dempsey clicked open an even grainier picture taken from a great distance and enhanced. The man was hunched down beside a semicircle of heavily armed men drawing a picture in the dirt. Recognize this guy? Chunk squinted at the image. Bin Jabbar again? Yes. Except now he calls himself Rafiq al-Mahajer. Five years ago we got a hit while he was working as an al-Qaeda mentor with Boko Haram in Cameroon. He tapped the forward button again. This is him with Abu Bakar Shekau. 
The fucking leader of Boko Haram? The senior seal interrupted. Yeah, Dempsey confirmed. Well, shit, Chunk said. He ain't no mid-level fuckstick now, is he? And he ain't a mooge anymore, the seal commander pointed out. He's out there in the suck now. Yeah, except he's not Al-Qaeda anymore either, Dempsey said. After that, he disappeared again. Until now. He clicked to a new picture of Al-Mahajer kitted up with an AK-47 and two bandoliers of ammunition. He was standing next to a sign on which Arabic had been spray-painted in red over English type. The Arabic translated to God's sword. The English beneath was still readable. Camp al Qaim. That's fucking al Qaim, Chunk said. Yep, five days ago, Dempsey confirmed. The senior officer pushed back from the table and stroked his chin with one hand. I see where this is headed, but give me the download anyway. This photograph indicates that Rafiq al-Mahajer has risen to a leadership position in the Islamic State's Iraqi front. We believe he will be attending the meeting tonight that you guys are tasked to hit. He ain't on my daily list, Chunk said. He's not one of the three targets we have for the meet either, unless he's using another alias. The spooks kept him off the list on purpose, the lieutenant commander suggested. Right, Mr. Dempsey? Dempsey nodded. But it's not as nefarious as it sounds. My group believes we're the only ones who know Al-Mahajer is going to be at this meet. This fucker is slippery and paranoid, so we didn't want to broadcast it to the entire IC and risk getting his antennae up. We're keeping this one close to the vest. Understand, fellas? The senior officer snorted again. And how the hell is that possible? Everything is linked and synced. I take a piss out here and five minutes later I get a text message that the Pentagon, NSA, and FBI are talking about my dick because the CIA snapped a picture of it. It's a joint bullshit world. How do you guys, whoever the hell you are, keep something like this to yourselves? We're outside of those circles, Dempsey said, choosing his words carefully. Then where do you get the information? Chunk blurted out. The NSA and OGA control everything. And who the hell analyzes it? The commander asked in rapid-fire succession. A mental picture of Ember's signals director, Ian Baldwin, and his two protégés, who Jarvis had dubbed Chip and Dale, popped into Dempsey's mind. He imagined the three men arguing about data sets and intersecting colored lines on a computer screen and somehow deducing where Al-Mahajer was going to turn up next. It's complicated, he said at last. And anyway, I don't really understand it myself, but I assure you, if my guys say Al-Mahajer will be there, then there's a 95% chance he'll be there. How bad do you want this fucker? Chunk asked. Really bad, Dempsey said. Any special reason beyond the obvious? The unit commander asked. Yes, Dempsey said and held the seal's gaze. Got it, Chunk said with a tobacco-stained grin. Super secret squirrel shit, I get it. How does this change my operation? For starters, we can expect him to bring a security detail with him, possibly a big one. I imagine for a snatch-and-grab like what was planned for tonight, you were running two teams of six with offset air, right? Chunk shrugged. Okay, well... I recommend two nine-man teams on site and a reserve squad to secure the perimeter for squirters, said Dempsey, remembering the last time this asshole had squirted and the aftermath that had led to Romeo being vaporized. Chunk nodded and looked at his boss. The SEAL commander nodded back and glanced at Dempsey with a look that said, Go on. You might also want air in orbit and Kazivak standing by, Dempsey added. There ain't no cavalry waiting in the bushes in Iraq these days, and al Qaim is a long way from Erbil and Baghdad. I don't want any of your guys getting hurt, but in the event someone does, I've arranged for a JSOC surgical team at the diplomatic mission complex here. The two SEAL officers looked impressed. How the hell did you arrange that? Chunk asked. My boss made it happen, Dempsey said, and left it at that. The secret surgical team was a Tier 1 asset that could do damage control surgery on a short fuse in battlefield conditions. 
In the austere setting they were operating in now, emergency trauma care could be the difference between life and death if one of the SEALs got hit. So, are my original targets still going to be there, or is that just a bullshit smokescreen you set up for the mission? Chunk asked. They should be there. My guy is the special guest coming to inspire and direct them. So we hit the house, we get our guys, or kill them, whatever, and then you take your guy and disappear into the night? Something like that, Dempsey said. Fine with me, Chunk said. You okay with this, boss? The unit commander looked at the grainy image on the laptop, and his mind went somewhere else probably to the Iraq war he had fought before Chunk had even finished Bud's. I'm more than fine with it, he said. Let's get this asshole. He looked at Dempsey with a little less disdain. And you'd like to ride along? Dempsey nodded. And I assume this is not your first rodeo. Dempsey laughed. I've had my eight seconds in the saddle, I promise. The SEAL commander nodded like he believed him. Okay. You'll be on Chunk's stick so he can babysit you. Slapping his junior officer on the back, he said, LT, get with your team leaders and replan this bitch with Mr. Dempsey. I'll go talk to Hal about air. And with that, the boss was gone. Who's Hal? Dempsey asked. The detachment leader for the group from the 160th. That's the special operations helicopter detachment we work with. Chunk was up on his feet and looked like a quarterback getting ready to take the field at the playoffs. Follow me, we got work to do if we want to keep our push time. Feeling more than a little nostalgic, Dempsey tried to suppress the grin forming on his face as he slipped the tablet computer back into his pocket. With his rifle in one hand, he slung his vest-style kit, packed with a radio, extra magazines, and other goodies, over his shoulder and followed Chunk back into the talk. All eyes turned to look at them. A civilian meeting with the leadership meant something had changed. It wasn't their first rodeo either.
damaged sort of a comment. Was she referring to Ember in this op? Or was she referring to the wedge between the two of them that had formed over the past year? Dempsey treaded cautiously. He didn't do emotions well. They were just too much damn work. And history had proven there was no return on investment. What do you mean? he asked, keeping his voice neutral. I mean, it's been a year, J.D., she sighed, her eyes still on the scope. A year since Operation Crusader. Amir Madiri is dead. Justice was meted. We fulfilled our charter. Yeah, what's your point? That this is mission number, what, 22 since Crusader? And here we are chasing down another random dirt bag. This is not Ember. There are plenty of other groups, groups specifically chartered for these activities that should be out here instead of us. This is not what Ember was conceived for. Snatching Alpha Kuri is not the type of op you give the B team. This is a direct action mission, exactly what Ember was conceived for. She disengaged from her rifle and looked at him. How is taking Alpha Kuri related to surveilling Truga two weeks ago in Nigeria? Or Mali Haswani in Qatar before that? Or Din Taluk Amin in Malaysia before that? They're all terrorists, Elizabeth, he said, his irritation rising. That's what we do. We find and stop terrorists. She shook her head. They're all unrelated terrorists. Can't you see it? Jarvis is running Ember ragged, chasing flies. Go here. Check on this guy. Now stop. Pack up. And go over there and check on that guy. Hold on. Change of plans. Go watch this other new guy instead. Okay, now shoot him. Thanks. Hurry up. Pack your bags. Time to surveil the next guy. It's ridiculous. That's what counterterrorism is, he said, exasperated. That's how it works in the IC. That's how it works for the intelligence community as a whole. But that's not what we do. Or not what we used to do. It's not why Ember was conceived. He sighed. Okay, fine. I'll play along. Tell me. What is it that we should be doing? We should be tasked to longitudinally prosecute whoever is the greatest threat to U.S. national security until that threat is dead and neutralized. Just like we did with Madiri and Vivac in Iran. I didn't sign on to swat flies, J.D. I signed on to slay dragons. What's happened to our autonomy? What happened to our focus? We should be hunting tomorrow's Bin Laden, tomorrow's Modiri. How do you know this guy's not the next Bin Laden? In five years, Alpha Kuri could become the type of guy you're talking about. Are you suggesting we leave him in play and wait and see if that happens? Alpha Kuri is definitely not the next Bin Laden, she said, screwing up her face at him. With a huff, she turned her attention back to her scope. Never mind. He watched her for a beat. On the one hand, he understood her frustration. When you were operating at the tip of the spear, sometimes it was hard to see the big picture. Maybe Alpha Kuri wasn't the next Bin Laden, but taking him out of the game made the world a safer place by removing a well-oiled cog from the global terrorism machine. Like it or not, swatting flies, as she'd called it, was part of an operator's job description. And besides... If there was another mastermind of proxy warfare like Amir Modiri out there, then Jarvis would give Ember tasking to take him down. If there was one thing in the universe that Dempsey had learned he could trust with unwavering confidence, it was that no matter how complex the problem, no matter how convoluted the details, the DNI saw the threat and knew how best to prosecute it. He shook his head, not sure what else to say to her, and forced his thoughts back to the mission at hand. Intelligence indicated the meet was scheduled to happen at sea, a prerequisite demanded by the other party. They didn't know who Al-Fakuri was meeting on the inbound yacht, but the mere fact that Al-Fakuri was not controlling the logistics was informative. Dempsey had already concluded that the unknown party in this meetup was a money guy. Of course, the money guy himself wouldn't actually be on that yacht. That's not how they operated. Money guys hovered above it all, conducting their nefarious business via proxies and lieutenants. Arms, length, separation, and layers of obfuscation were the name of the game. These were methods the bad guys had figured out a long, long time ago. Never do your own dirty work. 
The half moon hanging in the clear night sky provided enough light that he could see the Bilgin 156 luxury yacht without night vision. Even without the moon, it wouldn't have mattered. These guys were operating without stealth in mind. Purple mood lights illuminated the main deck, and the green-blue glow of the yacht's jacuzzi emanated from the stern. Dempsey was surprised he couldn't hear bass speakers thumping. It never ceased to amaze him how often men's carnal desires undermined their OPSEC. La Traviata crossing one nautical mile inbound, said a voice in Dempsey's earpiece. The voice belonged to Richard Wang, Ember's resident all-things cyber boy wonder, who was camped out in a room two levels below them. Dempsey pictured the young cyber nerd genius tapping away on his computer. A large diameter parabolic dish sitting beside the sliding glass door, a pile of energy drink cans strewn across the carpet, and a cold mocha cappuccino on the desk. Yes, Bronco, we can all see them, Dempsey growled. But when are you going to have comms up so we can hear them? Damn, you're grumpy tonight, Wang came back. He's always grumpy these days, Dan Munn chimed in from a third location, a corner room on the second story with a view of the beach and the access road leading to the marina. Munn had been tapped to lead Charger Team, a three-man assault force rounded out by Ember's two new sad recruits. The plan was to intercept Alpha Curry's convoy on the access road prior to its reaching the marina parking lot. Taking Alpha Curry on land was more covert, simpler, and less dangerous for the Ember assault team than conducting a maritime operation. Once they'd positively confirmed the target ship, they could leave it in play. Yachts weren't submarines. They were easy to track and hard to disappear. Plus, it would be interesting to see what the yacht did in reaction to Al Fakuri's no-show. What communications would follow? Where would the yacht go next? Disappearing Al Fakuri right before the meeting would incite a reaction, and every reaction was an opportunity to collect intelligence. Shit, Dempsey thought. Ember has me thinking like a spook all the time now. Fleet broadband, just like I suspected, Wang announced in a victorious tone. Say again, Dempsey asked. They're using fleet broadband on AlphaSat, Wang continued. You know, if I wanted to be rich, all I'd have to do is quit this rodeo and become a private IT contractor for these dumbasses. Get to the point, Bronco, Dempsey growled. We've got an arrangement with Inmarsat Maritime. Fleet broadband is their satellite internet service, and AlphaSat is the satellite covering Europe and the Mideast, the kid explained. And by we, I mean the NSA and me, and by the NSA and me, I mean the NSA. And what arrangement is that? That Inmarsat Maritime's encryption protocols are not as awesome as they advertise. I take that to mean you're in? Of course I'm in. They've got five computers and a half dozen mobile phones on the shipboard Wi-Fi network. What a bunch of knobs! I'm just going to turn all their phones into live mics, Wang said, chuckling. In principle, we should be able to listen in wherever anybody goes, even below decks. Hell, by the time I hijack all their shit, we won't even need the directional mic I dragged up here. Despite himself, Dempsey cracked a smile at that. Stabilis is Charger 1. While we wait on Bronco, has there been any chatter or movement from the primary target? Mun asked, referring to the Alpha Curry contingent staying at a guest house a few miles away. Nothing significant, Dan, or I would have reported it, Ian Baldwin, stable, answered from his workstation in Ember's Tactical Operations Center in Virginia. Dempsey pictured the tall, lanky mathematician turned Ember Signals Director standing behind his two young analysts, Chip and Dale, monitoring feeds from the satellites tasked for the op. That's a good indicator that despite the boat's arrival, they're probably not meeting tonight. Dempsey said into the thin mic boom beside his mouth. I did predict the meeting would occur after sunrise, if you recall, Baldwin said. We all remember, Stable, Dempsey said. That prediction was based on what again? Munn chimed in. I've tried to explain how the algorithms work, Dan, Baldwin said, using his only mildly exasperated voice and eschewing code names as usual. It's just math, Dempsey shook his head. It wasn't that Baldwin was undisciplined or sloppy. Rather, he was so supremely confident in Ember's comms gear and their encryption protocols that he made a habit of chatting in the clear. On the one hand, Dempsey got it. 
He'd been more than used to playing by big boy rules in his Tier 1 unit, but on the other hand, it just bugged him. Call sign protocol was born from blood, like so many of the operational methodologies they employed. Stable, this is Mustang. Let's try to keep it tight tonight. Call signs only, Dempsey said. After a cool beat, Baldwin came back. Copy, Mustang. I've got good visuals now, Grimes said to Dempsey, her right eye glued to her scope. One tango walking the port rail, two dudes on the stern, one smoking, and one holding a rifle. They look like security. He watched her switch the high-tech scope from night vision to thermal. On thermal, I've got two, no, three tangos on the bridge. Ship's captain perhaps sitting in the middle and two others facing him. Below decks, I have four tangos. Wait. Hold on a second. The tension in her voice and the way her body stiffened told him something unexpected had caught her attention. Make that five bodies below decks. Two of the five appear to be captive. She switched her headset to hot mic, and Dempsey heard her talking beside him and then half a beat later echoing in his left ear. Stable, this is Mustang. Thermals suggest we might have hostages on the boat. Do you have any intel suggesting this meeting could be a prisoner swap? There's been nothing in the previous comms between the parties to suggest that, Baldwin said. Some of the data suggests a transaction is scheduled for this meeting, but we assumed it was financial. I suppose we could revisit the raw data with this new insight in mind. Translation the professor doesn't know, Munn growled, interpreting for the team. What do you see, Mustang? Two seated bodies on thermal, Grimes said. Look like they're bound to chairs. Grimes adjusted her scope and then looked up at Dempsey. Want me to take a look? He asked. Yeah, please, she said, rolling onto her side, away from the rifle scope. His eyes flicked to the scar below her armpit, still thick and red, but healing up nicely. He leaned in from the other side of the table to peer through the scope. I see your five tangos below decks, three walking with weapons slung on shoulders and two seated hostages side by side. As he studied their postures and the shapes of their thermal signatures, his heart sank. He clicked the zoom detente up a notch on the scope. And they both appear to be female. Damn. Hostages. The one and only complication guaranteed to throw their entire operational playbook into the garbage can. He straightened and began to pace. Disappearing Alpha Kuri was the mission objective, not hostage rescue. Hitting the yacht had never been part of the plan, yet his brain had already started working the problem anyway. Revised mission scenarios began populating his mind. No, he thought, cutting himself off. We can't let the mission get derailed. Listen up, everybody, he announced on the comms channel. I realize this changes things emotionally, but it doesn't change the mission. Stay on task. Alpha Kuri is our objective. Hold on, Mun barked. Are you saying we're going to do nothing? We can't just let these assholes keep those girls and float away. I'm not saying that, but I'm also not saying we're going to change the op ord either, he said, trying to soften the blow. We need to analyze the situation. I need options and risk assessment. Hang on. They're moving the girls, Grimes said from beside him back on her rifle scope. Five glowing bodies coming up a ladder well. The two women, two armed escorts with rifles, and a third dude. They're passing through the mid-deck salon, heading aft to the party deck and the hot tub, I presume. Bronco, do you have ears? Dempsey asked. Good ears, Wang said, ditching his trademark sophomoric banter and now all business. They're talking fast, laughing. That's not Arabic. I'm not sure what language they're using. Stream it to me, Bronco, Baldwin said calmly. Dempsey raised his spotter scope and focused on the party deck. The women stood with stooped postures, heads down, arms hugging themselves. The man in the hot tub tipped his head back as if laughing at something. They're speaking Chechen, Baldwin reported. Chechen? Wang asked, his voice tight. That's weird. Stable, can you translate? Dempsey asked. None of us speaks Chechen, but we're running the stream through a real-time translation program. Don't expect better than 70% accuracy. Fine, just give me the play-by-play, -play, Dempsey barked. They look cold. Maybe they need to be warmed up, 
Baldwin said, relaying the translated audio from the yacht with a several-second delay. But they don't be having swimsuits. That is okay. This we can fix. Through the scope, Dempsey watched as one of the laughing guards began to rip the clothes off the woman standing on the left. No, not that one. The pretty one. The guard shoved the woman to her knees while the girl on the right swatted at the other guard pawing at her clothes, choosing instead to undress herself voluntarily. Smart and brave, better to get functional clothes back than shredded rags when this is all over, Dempsey thought as she climbed into the hot tub, covering her topless chest. Stable, can you get facial recognition from the bird? Dempsey asked. The satellite is overhead now, so the angle is bad, Baldwin said. Perhaps Elizabeth could... Sending imagery to Bronco now, Grimes said, leaning into her scope, her body visibly tense at the scene unfolding. The scope was wirelessly connected to the tablet on the table beside her and would send digital pictures, she snapped, to an encrypted file on Wang's computer. Got it. Relaying, Wang said. The girl in the hot tub was sitting opposite her tormentor, as far away as possible. To Dempsey's relief, the heavily muscled dirt bag in the tub was not making a move toward her, just laughing, smoking, and drinking. If he had to guess, Dempsey would peg this jackass as the ringleader. Don't tell me we're letting this happen, Mustang, Munn said, his voice a wet fire. I could put a fucking round right through his fat face, even from here, Grimes murmured. Stay on task, people, Dempsey said, working to keep his voice calm despite feeling the exact same aggravation as Munn and Grimes. Well, well, looks like I have a match, Baldwin said, his voice taking on the air of a man perusing the jelly aisle at the grocery and finding the last jar of fig preserves. Just give it to us, Dempsey said. More than ninety-seven percent. That is Sarah Bonney in the hot tub. The other woman has her back to us. If she turns, Elizabeth, be sure to get a picture. Roger that, Stable, she said, emphasizing his call sign to remind the signal's chief he was slipping again, but Dempsey suspected Baldwin was oblivious to the subtext. Sarah Bonney, the British aid worker? Wang asked. Yes. She's a pediatric surgeon. She and an American nurse, one Diana Curtis, disappeared from a refugee hospital run by Médecins Sans Frontières in Tunisia nearly two months ago. Ten bucks, says the other woman, is Diana Curtis. Munn chimed in. A sound bet, statistically speaking, of course. Baldwin came back. I remember that kidnapping, Dempsey grumbled, ignoring their banter. Didn't AQIM claim responsibility? Yes, Al-Qaeda Islamic Maghreb issued a statement the next day, Baldwin said. The attack left three wounded and two dead. CIA analysts tracked the group to a camp south of Ajabiya. A joint French commando and U.S. SEAL team hit the site 48 hours later, killing a few dozen terrorists, but Sarah and Diana were not found among the dead. Dempsey silently cursed Baldwin for identifying these women and sharing their story. Names? Made it real. Backstory made it real. Staying on mission had been a bitter pill for him to swallow before. But now, it was going to be gnaw off his fingers impossible. So these girls definitely changed hands at least once, Dempsey said, rubbing his beard. I'm not aware of regular contact between AQIM and any Chechen terror groups, though. I'm inclined to agree with you, Baldwin replied. This is strange. We can't leave them, J.D., Grimes said, talking off mic. We just can't. Let me take the leader out. With a word. She could send the asshole in the hot tub straight to hell and probably the pair of guards, too. But even if Grimes was perfect on the wind mag, she wouldn't be able to headshot everyone on that boat. The bad guys who survived would cut anchor and run, killing the girls later and then dumping the bodies overboard. On top of that, the Alpha Curry op would implode. Alpha Curry would squirt, and it would be months, maybe years, before they got another shot at him. What are we going to do? Munn asked in his ear. Dempsey said nothing as he watched the ringleader badger the girl in the hot tub into drinking champagne while the other woman rocked on the deck, hugging herself. Son of a bitch. 
What is your tactical recommendation, Charger 1? You're the strike lead. Dempsey Newman would see this as a test, but even a test would reveal where the man stood in his development as a team leader. Rescue up. I want to go get them, like, right fucking now. Understood, Dempsey said. But I didn't ask what you wanted to do. I asked for your tactical recommendation. He hated the cold-ass son of a bitch he had become. He hated how knowing the big picture had made him a spook, a Jones, they would have called him back in the SEAL teams. At times like these, he wished he was still a door kicker. It was so much easier to hate the higher-ups for making the unpopular call than to have to make the hard call himself. If we hit the yacht now, Alpha Cory will squirt, Munn said in a tight, strained voice. That's right, Dempsey said. But we have satellite coverage. We can track the yacht, notify the Italians, and they can soar to your rescue. It's not a lost cause, people. So unless anybody can convince me of a way to rescue the hostages without jeopardizing the Alpha Curry op, we stay the course. Grimes lifted her head and turned to look at him. He met her eyes. She didn't say anything. She didn't have to. He hated himself for making this call. But it was the right call. I have an idea, Munn said, his voice suddenly hopeful. Let me come up and pitch it to you. Of course you do, Dempsey thought, shaking his head. He glanced at his Sunto watch. Assuming Baldwin was right, which, statistically, he invariably was, they still had more than six hours until the sunrise meet. All right, come up and tell me what you've got. We have a positive ID on the other hostage, Baldwin suddenly announced. 81% confidence level, she is Diana Curtis, mother of three from Canton, Ohio. Dale has just informed me her husband is a pastor. This was her first trip outside Connus, a mission trip coordinated through her church. Wonderful, just what I didn't need to hear, Dempsey mumbled to himself as he began to pace. Whatever Munn's plan was, he hoped it had legs. Because despite the risk, despite the orders, Dempsey knew himself. When it came to making the hard choices, his heart always found a way to fuck things up. Chapter 2 Unregistered Domestic Detention Center, Tampa, Florida, September 15, 1715, local time. The buzzer sounded, the lock clicked, and the man Amanda Allen knew simply as Doug opened the door for her. Thanks, Doug, Amanda said. How are the kids? Doing great, he said, his serious expression mismatched with the amiability in his voice. Mark just started band and the triplets joined the swim team. Coach said too bad we didn't pop out one more girl because then we could have our own relay team. This answer surprised her and she chuckled. The exchange was a little running joke between them that had developed organically over the past month. She doubted he had kids. Hell, she wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't married. Each time he gave her a different answer with different kids' names, sexes, ages, and activities. Doug was a glorified jailkeeper, guarding one of Russia's most highly trained covert operatives, a Russian Zeta named Sylvie Besinov. Under no circumstances did Doug want his charge to learn anything personal or of consequence that could be used to manipulate him. But Amanda suspected he was also bored out of his mind, and this was the only novelty in his daily routine. I thought Jasper was taking skydiving lessons, she said, pausing at the threshold. Who's Jasper? he asked, his expression deadpan. She flashed him a conspiratorial smile and headed inside. He shut the door behind her with a thud, and she heard the lock mechanism engage. Amanda worked for Task Force Ember. In a strange turnabout, she'd been recruited by the same people who'd rescued her from terrorists less than a year ago. Her abduction had been a false flag operation devised by Arkady Zhukov and executed by a Zeta operative, Valerian Kobak, who had functioned under the legend Anzor Malik. The same Russians were responsible for the murder of Ember director Shane Smith, operations officer Simon Adamo, and SAD operator June Latif during the attack on Ember's previous headquarters 
in Newport News, Virginia. Dempsey had made sure Malik paid the ultimate price. But Zhukov, the mastermind behind the attack, was still at large. Since that fateful day, life at Ember had been a roller coaster ride. No, not a roller coaster, she thought. More like post hurricane disaster recovery. Sure, they'd all rolled up their sleeves and put on brave faces, but if she was being honest with herself, all was not well with America's premier covert black ops task force. The stability, purposeful leadership, and tactical clarity that Smith and Adamo had brought to the organization were missing. The vacuum left in their absence was tangible. Signal's Chief Baldwin was functioning as acting director, and Mann had stepped into Adamo's old role as OPSO. The thing was, neither man wanted his respective promotion, and it showed. Baldwin, while knowledgeable and undeniably the most intellectually gifted member of the organization, lacked the operational experience and leadership skills to effectively lead and manage an organization as complex and dynamic as Ember. Munn, on the other hand, had the operational experience and a doctor's sensibility for reading and relating to people, but did not have the calculated, methodical disposition that had made Adamo so successful as Opso. From the stories she'd heard about Munn, she knew he had the capacity to be cool and analytical under pressure, but that was not his default state. The man wore his heart on his sleeve, tended to be reactive rather than proactive, and wanted nothing more than to be back out in the field as Dempsey's wingman. The lumberjack wanted his old job back and wasn't shy about letting everyone know it. We all just need a little more time, Amanda told herself. Just a little more time and everything will sort itself out. She stepped into what was essentially an efficiency apartment where Sylvie Besanov was incarcerated. Instead of being dumped into a dark hole at some black site overseas, the DNI had agreed to keep Besanov close and accessible. The whack-a-mole operation they were presently running, finding and assassinating embedded Zeta field operators around the globe, was only possible because of the intelligence Besanov had given up. The operation to break the Russian woman had been a psychological mindfuck of epic proportions, one in which Amanda had played a critical and unwitting role. In the days and weeks since, Amanda had taken over as Besanov's interrogator and, dare she say, handler. During that time, she had successfully extracted the names of five Zetas, and their assigned cities of operation, an accomplishment she was feeling pretty proud of, especially since she had achieved it without resorting to any enhanced interrogation techniques. Hello, Sylvie, Amanda said to the back of the Russian girl's head. Besanov was sitting on a sofa watching television with the sound turned off. She had not turned around to look when Amanda entered, nor did she say anything now. Amanda walked around the sofa, giving the Russian a wide berth. The Zeta had never shown any aggression. Still, Amanda's ordeal at the hands of Malik had permanently rewired her psyche. She knew what human beings were capable of. The scheming, the hate, the violence. Besanov could snap at any time, and the Russian's past interactions and behavior could not be relied upon as a predictor for this or any future engagement between them. It was imperative to be careful. She sat in the lone chair beside the sofa and looked at her charge. Besanov was slumped in her seat, feet up on the coffee table, legs apart, fingers knitted together and resting on her stomach. Her unblinking eyes were fixed on the TV, which was playing what looked like an episode of Survivor. Why do you watch with the sound turned off? Amanda asked. Because it doesn't matter what they say, Besanov said in Russian-accented English. I can discern the hierarchy and lies from their body language and expressions alone. The words are a distraction from the truth. Interesting, Amanda said, and flashed the Russian her it's-all-good smile, an expression that lived halfway between a flight attendant's I'm paid to smile at you and a co-worker's let's-grab-a-beer-and-catch-up grin. 
In her experience, smiles were the transactional currency that powered business, politics, friendship, romance, and even interrogations. How she smiled, when she smiled, if she smiled. These were the variables that Sylvie cued off of. How, when, and if Sylvie smiled was equally insightful. Amanda shifted her gaze from Bessanov to the television and watched in silence for thirty seconds or so before asking, Do you have reality shows like this in Russia? I like to watch these idiots, Bessanov said, ignoring the question. Walking around in their underwear, arguing all the time. It's quite funny. Take away our jobs, our technology, and our houses, and this is what humanity becomes. A troop of monkeys fighting for table scraps and sexual hierarchy. Amanda looked from the TV back to Besinov. She tried to think of something to say, but her mind was stuck on the monkey metaphor. She remembered what it had felt like when Malik had reduced her to her primal state, stripping her naked, withholding food and water, and controlling her most basic and fundamental biological liberties. She'd been caged and dehumanized, and so in one respect that made her, and her charge, kindred spirits. She empathized with the Russian girl and wondered if that was why Baldwin had tapped her to manage Ember's MVP detainee. You seem quite melancholy today, Amanda settled on. Is everything all right? What a ridiculous thing to ask me, Besinov fired back, making eye contact for the first time. You've taken everything from me, my profession, my colleagues, my country, my dignity, not your dignity, Amanda snapped. We've never taken that. And trust me, I'm someone who can speak with authority on such matters. The decision to abandon your dignity is yours and yours alone. How can there be dignity without purpose? You've made me a traitor. You come here asking for names, and I give them to you so you can murder my countrymen. There is no dignity in that. No dignity in betrayal and weakness. No dignity in self-preservation when you sacrifice all your principles in the process. I should have kept quiet. I should have let you torture me until I was dead. Amanda laughed. She didn't mean to. It wasn't scripted or deliberate. It just came out. So you're laughing at me now, Besanov said, her voice a serpent's hiss. I'm a joke to you. No, Amanda said, shaking her head. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the stupid irony of it all. We're both here because of him. Our lives forever maligned and spinning like two billiard balls sent careening off course. Besanov just shook her head at this. Your old life may be over, but your future is unwritten. I made you a promise that when this was over, you would be given a new identity and the resources to start a new life. Yes, Sylvie Besanov may be dead. But you are young and have a second act in you. There is nothing stopping you from pursuing a new career. Finding love, becoming a mother, the possibilities are limitless. There's more to life than espionage and cold wars. Fuck you, the Russian girl murmured under her breath. Excuse me, Amanda bristled. Besanov exhaled loudly through her nose. Dmitry Godunov, last I knew he was working as a professor in Berlin under the alias Erich Habicht. Her gaze was fixed, back on the television, her voice flat and lifeless. What is his mission? The same as every Zeta, to do his job so well no one suspects he's a Russian spy. That's not what I meant. I know, but it was a stupid question, so you got a stupid answer. Am I to take that to mean you haven't run any ops with him? That's correct. He's been embedded for a long time. Not one of the more active Zetas. He's not been running any significant operations. Then what is he doing in Berlin? He must be there for some reason. I don't know all the details I've told you. The structure in Zeta is very compartmentalized. Amanda pursed her lips in irritation at the other woman. Then speculate. Fine, 
Besanov said through a sigh. Supposedly, his father was a brilliant theoretical physicist who worked for decades at the Lebedev Institute. The hope was that Dmitri was as gifted as his father, but he wanted nothing to do with academics and pursued a career in soldiering. But Arkady misses nothing and snatched him up, enchanting Dmitri with double or seven dreams of spycraft and glorious covert operations. But the reality was Arkady needed someone smart enough to understand and steal cutting-edge research and intellectual property in the fields of theoretical and applied physics. So the old man put Dmitri in Berlin because the Germans are very good at this sort of thing. Is Dmitri married? Amanda asked. I don't know. Dmitri's German knock is Erich Habicht, she said, confirming the name. The room was under 24-hour surveillance and all their conversations were recorded, but maintaining pretenses and authentic conversational rhythms was important. Habicht, spelled H-A-B-I-C-H-T. That's right, Besanov said. Now run along, little sister. Come back when he's dead and I'll give you another name. Amanda stared at her for a long moment, then pressed to her feet. Is there anything I can get you? A Makarov would be nice, but any gun will do. I just need one bullet. Good night, Sylvie, she said with a sad smile, and walked to the door. Doug let her out. After the door was shut and locked behind her, he said, How's she doing? Amanda paused, surprised by the question, as the big man had never once inquired about his charge. It's a P.F. Chang's night, she said, running her fingers through her dirty blonde hair. Mongolian beef. Once, in a moment of sororal weakness, Sylvie had confessed that Mongolian beef from the popular Asian fusion chain was her favorite. Ordering it for her on the days she gave up a name had become something of a tradition between them. Roger that, he said. See you next time. Back at you, she echoed with a nod and headed to her car. Once she was seated inside with the engine running and doors locked, she called Ember. Mun, a familiar gruff voice said, picking up the secure line. I got a name, Eric Habicht, she said with a bittersweet undertone that she didn't try to hide. He's in Berlin. Nice work, Amanda, Mun said. Head on home and we'll get to work putting together a package.
finding it easy to sound gay speaking French. I know, I know, but it's cold and I can't wait all night. Okay, then hurry up and get that tight ass of yours over here so you can warm me up. He paused as if listening to his lover's reply, while in reality he was straining to hear bits of the hushed conversation between the two approaching Americans. I don't care, Jason. My gut tells me he'll spook. Stay at the edge of the park and run some counter for me. It's a big fucking park. I don't like leaving you alone and unprotected like that. Well, that's the job. I'm perfectly capable of handling a 65-year-old academic, I assure you. He's not just some random professor, Anne. That's the point of this. Just meet me at— As they passed out of earshot, her last words were impossible to make out. It didn't matter. It would have been useful to know where the American partners were supposed to rendezvous after the meet, but this information was secondary. The essential takeaway was that the female agent was his target, and her colleague was running counter-surveillance. Ça va, ça va, à bientôt, he said into the mobile and pretended to end the call. He set an alarm timer with a ringtone, then slipped the mobile phone back into his pocket. The toy poodle, which was huddling on his lap, licked his hand. He gave it another treat and affectionately rubbed its head until the Americans were out of sight around the corner. Then he set the dog on the ground and set off in trail. After a few steps, he remembered to put some sway back in his hips as he scanned the park around him. Other than the two Americans, it appeared to be deserted. Cyrus wondered if Arkady had known that the target would be a woman. Of course the old bear did. This was all part of making his final exam a true test. During their time together, the Russian spymaster had quickly discovered all his weaknesses, including his devotion to his mother and a predisposition for chivalry toward women instilled in him by his father. But he was a Persian millennial, and like his Western counterparts, he thought and viewed the world differently from the generation in power. Despite the Supreme Leader's concerted efforts to keep Persian women as second-class citizens— Cyrus viewed them as intellectual equals deserving of the same opportunities, and he didn't care what the Qur'an said on the matter either. To lead one's life according to the archaic scrivenings of men whose worldview was centuries out of date was lunacy. Of course, he would never verbalize his true opinions on such things in Persian company. Doing so in front of his uncle would have disastrous consequences. As he rounded the bend, the target came into view. She was seated on a bench recessed into a small arc of gravel that dipped a few feet into the tree line. She was alone and loitering, her colleague running counter-detection surveillance as she had instructed. Any minute now, the Belarusian informant would arrive and greet her and, in doing so, seal her fate. The timer went off on his phone and the ringtone sounded. He retrieved it, swiped and pretended to answer an incoming call. As he passed the American agent, speaking in French, he smiled at the woman. She was quite young, much younger than he'd expected, not much older than he was, in fact, mid-twenties, perhaps. And she was pretty, very Slavic, with high slanted cheekbones, a hard, angular nose and jaw, and deep-set, almond-shaped eyes. He continued to babble in French, tugging gently on the bejeweled leash as he passed. He could feel her eyes on his back as he strutted around the corner. He felt a twinge of hesitation. Why does Arkady want this girl dead? But no sooner had the thought crossed his mind than he heard Arkady's voice in his head, as clear as if the Russian were walking next to him. Never ask this question. It is not a matter of what I want. It is not a matter of what you want. You are a weapon of the state. Today, you are an instrument of foreign policy. Tomorrow, a stratagem. And the next day, maybe you are settling a personal grudge on the whim of the president. It does not matter. These things are not your concern. Does a precision-guided missile contemplate the implications of its payload on its target? Yet. You do not think. You only do. If your orders were to kill me tonight instead of this girl, could you do it? Could you do it? Da, he heard himself say. Under Arkady's tutelage, he had come to view himself as a computer program, 
executing line after line of code without emotion or contemplation until the instructions were completed. This was how the mind of the perfect assassin was supposed to operate. Just yesterday the Russian had embraced him like a father while confessing how proud he was of Cyrus's progress. Then, a beat later, Arkady drew his blade and aimed the point at his own heart. Could you drive this blade into my chest if ordered to do so? His teacher had asked. Yes, he'd replied. Then do it. Kill me. This is your final test. Take my life and take my place. Robotically, Cyrus took the knife and plunged it into the Russian's chest. Arkady had grunted and stumbled backward from the blow, but the blade failed to penetrate. Very good, my son, the old Russian said with a laugh, lifting his sweater to reveal a puncture-resistant ballistic vest. Very, very good. If he could kill Arkady, he could kill this woman. He felt nothing for her. She was not a woman, she was a weapon of the state, of the American state, the same intelligence machine that had left him brotherless, left him fatherless, left him motherless. He twisted the leash in his hands. He was ready. He stopped on the path, cocking a hip to the side and talking more animatedly on his phone while scanning the path behind him as well as in all three other directions. He saw nothing. The American agent conducting counter-surveillance was either well hidden or out of range. He would learn which soon enough. Cyrus swept the small dog up into his arms and slipped quietly over the low black chain that marked the edge of the path, then disappeared into the dark of the woods. He looked down at the white-haired dog in his arms, its tongue out and tail wagging, expecting yet another treat. He patted the dog's head, hesitating for only a moment before doing the deed. Unencumbered now, he stripped off the blue leather jacket and print shirt he'd been wearing, exposing the skin-tight black tactical shirt beneath. He rolled the sleeves down and pulled tactical gloves from his back pocket and slipped them on over his hands. He had only a few more minutes before the Belarusian arrived, giving him just enough time to conduct his own counter-surveillance sweep. As he moved silently through the trees and underbrush, Arkady's tutelage echoed in his mind. On the hunt, forget your technology. Embrace your senses. You are an animal, a predator. Rely on your ears. Use your sense of smell. Your nose might be your only means of detecting danger. If you do not do this, then you are no longer the hunter. You become the prey. After successfully clearing the woods, he approached the park bench where his target sat waiting. He took a knee and scanned in all directions. Then he closed his eyes and inhaled deeply through his nose. To his surprise, he was able to detect a feminine scent, perfume or maybe a floral soap. A beat later, another scent registered. The Belarusian must have arrived because the air now carried the musky tang of sweat and cigarettes. He crept forward until he could just barely make out snippets of the conversation taking place in Russian. Although Arkady had not shared with him any of the background precipitating this meeting of spies, Cyrus had his own working hypothesis. During the past six months he had immersed himself in Eastern European politics and become a student of Russian clandestine strategy at work in the region. According to the file, the informant was a professor at Belarusian State University in Minsk. However, Cyrus suspected this was his official cover, and that the old man had Siloviki roots. It was no secret that Belarusian President Lukashenko maintained a cooperative relationship with Russian President Petrov, and that the Belarusian security service worked closely with its Russian counterparts. Men like this Belarusian professor had proven to be much more effective at gathering intelligence inside the Baltic states than Russian operatives. It made sense to Cyrus. A government official in one of the Baltic states would certainly be less suspicious if approached by a Belarusian academic than by a Russian. Knowing this, the FSB made use of partner agency operatives. If Americans were aware of the FSB's tactics, then it made sense the CIA would try to find informants to turn inside the retired Belarusian Siloviki network. From his back pocket, Cyrus retrieved the paring knife he'd taken from the gay Crimean's apartment. 
He quietly slipped off the plastic sheath and slid it into his pocket. Clutching the blade in his right hand, he listened as the Belarusian spoke about some operation in the Ukraine. Cyrus shelved the names in his head, should they be demanded during post-op debriefing with Arkady. The American asked why a history professor should have such knowledge. Answers came. Finally, the Belarusian's nerves seemed to get the better of him, and he said, I need to go. I would like to meet again, the woman said. Perhaps, the professor answered and then coughed. I have much more information. This is but a taste, a small amount, so you will know I am of value. But it comes with a price. Get me out of Belarus. Get me out of this service. I want to spend the rest of my days somewhere warm, like Antigua. I'll speak with my superiors. How will I get in touch with you? Cyrus heard the shuffling of the older man getting to his feet. He peered through the brush and saw the Belarusian standing beside the bench. The woman was up now, too. Don't contact me. I'll signal you when I'm ready, just as before, he said, looking around nervously. Cyrus wondered if the performance was an act for his benefit or if the Belarusian man was exactly what he'd portrayed, a tired old spy wishing to check out of the game for good. The American woman handed him a scrap of paper. Memorize this. It's my personal number. I can be ready to get you at a moment's notice. They shook hands, and the old man turned and headed north along the path. The American spy turned and walked south. Cyrus moved with the stealth and speed of a tiger through the trees, keeping low and staying parallel to the woman, the blade clutched in his right hand. Their vectors were converging at the point where the sidewalk bent left, nearly touching the tree line before it changed direction to arc around a lily pond. His preference was to take her there because he could remain hidden until the very last second. But if she attempted to make contact with her colleague before that, he would strike early. As it were, the two triggers merged into one, with the American spy pulling her phone from her coat pocket just as she approached the bend. Cyrus caught himself panting, not with fear or fatigue, but with excitement. Any hesitation he had felt at killing the woman was gone. There was now only predator and prey. He shifted the blade to his left hand and readied himself. As she walked past his hide, he stepped silently onto the path behind her. He snaked his left arm around her torso and simultaneously clamped his free right hand onto her windpipe. She made a soft, nah! sound as he lifted her completely off the ground and disappeared her into the trees. He twisted at the waist and threw her hard onto the ground. Before she had time to recover her wits and breathe, before her self-defense training kicked in, he drove the paring knife into her neck at the base of her skull. The woman's body instantly went slack, and the stench of excrement hit him a beat later as her bladder and bowels let go. Cyrus withdrew the blade and crouched beside her, scanning and listening for her partner. The night was still. Not a sound, not a shadow. He grabbed the woman by the collar of her jacket and dragged his quarry deeper into the woods. Ten meters in, he rolled the body over. Looking at her pretty Slavic face, her painted lips frozen open in surprise, a strange compulsion washed over him, and he kissed her. She tasted of lip balm, stale coffee, and fear. You are my first, he whispered and gently brushed her blonde hair off her forehead. Thank you. Bring me proof, physical proof, that it's her and she's dead said Arkady's voice in his head. He gripped her ear and positioned the paring knife to take it, but before making the cut realized that an ear was not positive identification, something the Russian would probably demand. So instead he sliced off her right thumb at the end of the first metacarpal. Dark blood dribbled, did not spray from the wound, confirming her heart had stopped beating and she was finally dead. He wrapped the severed thumb in his handkerchief and shoved it into his pocket. He quickly found her identification, powered off her mobile phone, and stuffed both items into his other pocket. Then, without regret or afterthought, he walked away and disappeared into the night. For Josh Stanton Chapter 2 Grimes tensed on the long, low table where she lay watching the events below through her spotter scope. 
This op was now a shit show of epic proportions. If Dempsey survived, she would tell him that, and then she would punch him in his big, stupid face for putting her through this hell. Focus, she told herself. He needs me in the game. She exhaled slowly while counting to four, calming herself. She shifted her attention to the Vori on the roof. The sniper was watching the scene below through his oversized optics, just like she had been, but nothing in his body language suggested he was about to engage. She was at the same elevation as the other sniper, and to keep a line on him and on the shooters on the ground required her to be closer to the window than she liked. She tilted her head to peer around her scope and keep tabs on the scene down below. Dempsey and Munn were slowly backpedaling, their weapons still pointed at track. The other Russian up front, Aldi, had brought his AK-12 up and was siding on Dempsey. The two guards behind them were fanning out right and left, so their bosses wouldn't be in their line of fire if this standoff turned into a shootout. Shit, this is not good, she cursed under her breath, belatedly aware that the whole team could hear her. She leaned into sight through her scope and positioned the dimly lit red arrow on the side of the Vori sniper's head. This guy was the biggest problem, and she would have to take him first. But her mind quickly went to work, planning her follow-on sequence of shots. Dempsey and Munn were best positioned to kill Track and Aldi, which were their closest and most immediate threats. Munn was stuck with a pistol, so knowing Dempsey, after shooting Track, he would slide left to take out both the two rear shooters. That left the driver leaning against the hood of the Russian SUV free to cut them down, which made that guy her second priority. The rear shooter on Munn's side was the third biggest threat in case he took cover or Dempsey missed. Last were the reinforcements inside the building who would rush to engage and the roving patrol who she presently couldn't see. She scratched an annoying itch on the left side of her nose and decided on her kill sequence. One, rooftop sniper. Two, SUV driver. Three, door guards. Four, clear the field of reinforcements as required. She tilted her head off the scope for another look below. Track lifted a closed fist high over his head and then glanced over his shoulder at the guards behind him, who both froze and lowered their weapons. Wait, wait, Track said. She could hear the Russian in her earpiece from Dempsey and Munn's ultra-sensitive transmitters. Let me telling Amarov. Let me using my phone. I am sure he had no idea this would upset you. No need to leave. Wait, please. Everyone down below froze, except for Track, who raised his phone to his ear and began talking. She leaned into her scope to check the Vori roof sniper, and found him tight in on his rifle now. Damn it, she cursed, this time in her head. That sealed it. She was going to have to draw first blood, otherwise one of her boys was getting shot. Track is saying Bravo is spooked and will not come inside, Baldwin translated in her ear. I can't hear the reply. Oh, wait. Looks like we have an inbound call from a prefix in Vyborg, Russia, but we don't have decryption. Several long, tense seconds passed before Track signed off his call and lowered the phone from his ear. Amarov is coming, my friend. We are being apologizing. We are meaning not discourtesy, I am assuring you. When neither Munn nor Dempsey reacted, he said, Perhaps you could be lowering your weapons? When neither man complied, Track took two paces to Dempsey's right, his hands still up and off his slung rifle. What's he up to? Still off her scope, Grimes shifted her gaze from the parking area to the rooftop sniper, assessing the firing angle, and she understood. Bravo Track is opening a lane between you guys and their sniper? she said, her voice tight as she eased her cheek against her weapon. She exhaled a long, slow breath and steadied her red arrow on the head of the Russian sniper and pulled gentle tension into her trigger finger. 
And I have more bad news, Baldwin said. Thermals are moving inside the building, three bodies leaving and two coming toward you. And, uh-oh, they just mobilized their QRF vehicle. It's circling northwest to flank you and block your exit. Alpha, this is Omega, Smith's voice said in her ear. You're clear to engage. Roger, she said. Bravo, call the ball. The urge to check the scene below was overpowering, but she didn't dare take her eye off her optics. No matter what, no exceptions, she had to take the first shot. But she had to give Dempsey and Munn the opportunity to work the angles and the tactical situation on the ground to their optimal advantage before the shooting started. Forgive me, my new friend, Munn said to Track. I have been betrayed before, and it cost me the lives of my men. I'm sure you understand. So, as a gesture of goodwill, let me open the case and show you the money. She imagined Mun setting the steel briefcase down on the ground and slowly opening the lid. The point of all this showmanship was not to stall, but to reposition in a way that would change the Russian sniper's firing angle. This was invaluable information that she could not ascertain from her perpendicular perspective. Who was the Russian sniper's primary target, Munn or Dempsey? You're a genius, Dan, she thought as she watched the Russian shooter hold perfectly still. Bravo 2 is the target, Grimes said, letting the team know Dempsey was the primary. This way we can have trust. Munn continued. You can count the money and tell Amarov that everything is legitimate. I am sure that is not being necessary, Track said, moving slightly back to the left. We trust you have been bringing what you have said. Mr. Amarov bringing sample missile, and then we can concluding our business for the day. Perhaps we are having more trust in next time we are meeting. The red arrow centered on the Russian sniper's temple, and as she slowed her breathing and pulse, it slowed its bounce, finally becoming still. She watched the Russian press in on his own rifle, and she took a long breath. The window is closing, Alpha. The QRF is rounding the building, Baldwin said with uncharacteristic urgency. Ready, Grimes said. She was in her zone now, her voice ice. Take him, Dempsey said softly. What? Track said, confused. She exhaled and squeezed the trigger. The sniper's head barfed up a red cloud and his rifle slipped from his grip, clattering over the tile roof and catching on a vent pipe by its sling. His dead body slowly slid down the roof after it. Track turned and looked over his right shoulder and shouted at the Russian sniper he thought had fired. Prakrati idiot! Medolzhny ichvishich! Then he turned back and his eyebrows arched in surprise to see Dempsey and Munn still standing. He is telling them they were supposed to take you alive, Baldwin reported in her ear, but she didn't care. Speed and accuracy were all that mattered. She was a killing machine now as she swept the barrel of her rifle onto her next target. The shooter crouched behind the Russian SUV. Her targeting arrow found the shooter's forehead. Exhale. Trigger squeeze. The Russian's head exploded like a piñata, and she swept her sight toward her third planned target, the rear shooter on Munn's side. As she whisked across the field of battle, her brain rapidly reconstructed the blur of imagery into a comprehensible picture. She'd seen a muzzle flare from Dempsey's scar as he shot track. She'd noted Munn using the steel briefcase as a shield as he unloaded on Aldi. And that was it. She made a quick correction while leading the flanking Russian shooter on Munn's side and dropped him with a headshot. She scanned up, worried that the other might have the jump on Dempsey, but saw the man's body crumple amid a volley from the scar. She scanned right back to the building entrance, just in time to catch two shooters squirting out the door, shoulder to shoulder, with guns blazing. 
Trigger squeeze, trigger squeeze. She dropped both shooters in succession. Less than two seconds had elapsed. Five rounds left in this magazine. Alpha, Russian QRF vehicle is engaging. Will be in your line of sight in three. She trained her sight to the expected elevation of the driver's side window. Two, dialed in a small correction for the range. One. The Russian 4x4 came tearing around the corner of the building. Her elevation estimate was off, but she quickly compensated, exhaled, and squeezed the trigger. The round punched a hole in the driver's side window and slammed into his head just above the ear. The vehicle slowed and abruptly veered right, turning away from her before she could pop the other occupants. Instead of wasting bullets, she waited for them to climb out. Bravo, we hold three thermals moving toward the rear exit, Baldwin reported. I assume they are exfilling Amarov to vehicle number two, which is waiting on the other side of the building at idle with a driver ready. Grimes followed Baldwin's report with, Bravo, Alpha, I'm on the QRF vehicle. The driver is dead, and I have your backs if the shooters exit. You are clear to egress to the van and bug out. But Dempsey wasn't running to the van. He was staring at the factory building. What are you doing? She barked into her mic. Get the hell out of there! Chapter 2 Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force Tactical Operations Center, 5th Tactical Fighter Wing Command Building, Rokaf, Taiwan. Jiashan Air Force Base, Hualien, Taiwan, 0615 local time. Whitney Watts, the lead intelligence analyst for Gold Squadron of the elite Navy Tier 1 SEAL team, shook her head at Chunk as he strolled into the room. She watched him whisper something to newly minted Chief Petty Officer Yi, who sat across the conference table with her laptop open. Yi laughed at whatever self-congratulatory quip Chunk had said into her ear and took a long sip from her coffee tumbler. Feeling pretty good about yourself, huh, boss? Watts said as Chunk dropped into the seat next to Yi. I am, actually, he said with his best Texas grin. He ran a hand through hair that was becoming a bushy mop these days. She had to admit it was a good look for him. Not that she would ever tell him so. Thanks to Team Spence, we ran a perfect up. But did you? She said, bobbing her head dubiously side to side so the sarcasm was unmistakable. Embarrassing Team 2 is one thing, but I'm not sure we achieved any diplomatic goals by humiliating our Taiwanese counterparts. Chunk seemed to consider the comment a moment before leaning in on his elbows and saying, I respectfully disagree. If the head shed was looking to massage the egos of the Taiwanese special forces, they would have sent a white side platoon from Team 3 or 5 to run the red cell up. Better yet, they could have just had the 75th Rangers conduct an airborne infill for them to repel without our op to prep the field. We've worked closely with Taiwan SEALs in the past and have a great relationship. They're the real deal and full-on pros. And we didn't humiliate them. On the contrary, by bringing our A-game, we showed them great respect, showed them we don't need to handhold or stroke egos. Frankly, we treated them like equals, which I have no doubt they appreciate greatly. She considered that a moment, but he continued before she could respond, using the nickname she'd earned on her first day, her least favorite way to be addressed in a group, which he, of course, knew. And anyway, heels, this ain't like family Christmas where you let the nieces and nephews win at Monopoly, he said, his southern drawl thickening somehow. The Taiwanese asked us to help them prepare, both tactically and strategically, for a future Chinese invasion. China has made no secret of its desire to annex Taiwan back into the fold, and their military is ferocious, cunning, and deadly. Do you really think they won't leverage embedded assets to sneak onto this base and pave the way for an attack? I would argue that we created a realistic security breach scenario for which the personnel on this base should be prepared. This engagement was never intended to be some team-building, trust-fall kind of exercise. On the contrary, we are preparing them for war. She pursed her lips but nodded. As usual, 
Chunk's words made sense and betrayed the cunning intellect he hid beneath the good old boy aw shucks persona he liked to wear like a softball team sweatshirt. The Chinese threat is real, Heels, Spence added, dropping into the chair beside Chunk. The grin he wore confirmed that he too knew how much she hated that name. She kept her expression neutral, refusing to give him the satisfaction of a tell that had bothered her, which she'd learned just encouraged more ribbing. Russia invaded Ukraine and nobody thought that would happen. What's to prevent China from doing the same? I hear you, but I'm pretty sure if a bunch of Chinese SOF guys show up in Team 2 ball caps at the front gate, security is not going to let them in. You took advantage of Team 2's authorized presence here on base to exploit a vulnerability that the Chinese could not, she said, getting to the heart of what was bothering her and, undoubtedly, everyone else on the blue side of the exercise. I disagree, and let me tell you why, Chunk said, leaning in on his elbows. We exploited the optimal vulnerability available to us. If we had tried to come on base as a Taiwanese catering company, they would have shut us down. And you are correct in saying that if a van of Chinese operators showed Team 2 ball caps and DOD CAC cards, that would be a red flag and base security would stop them. But that's not what they'd do. They'd use a knock that makes sense for them, which is exactly what we did. The point, as far as I'm concerned, is that this base and its security personnel need to take a hard look at every contractor and organization with access and how that access might be exploited. What we did tonight was alert them to the reality that they're vulnerable. We hit them with something they expected and something they did not expect simultaneously. Team 2 and the Taiwanese worked fluidly and kinetically to rebuff the expected threat. They countered Bravo's breach to the north expertly, and once they became aware of Alpha's penetration, they secured the gates and ran a counteroffensive to prevent loss of the Whiteside airfield. They surprised us with the embedded team at the tower. Which you defeated with no casualties on our side, she said. Because we're so badass, Riker said while packing a tin of Copenhagen long cut in his left hand. He opened the lid and slipped a pinch into his lower lip. But they'll do better next time. You don't learn and adapt from winning. The best lessons come from losing. She knew all this, of course, because it was her job to know it. She didn't need them to teach her, but the conversation reinforced a different point. Her brother Seals were far more than just operators, more than just door kickers. They were the PhDs of war fighting, thinking outside the box and using unconventional tactics and methods to push boundaries and test limits in every engagement. This red cell op, with all its trickery, proved that. Chunk's logic about how the Chinese might exploit security with embedded agents in Knox was valid, and so long as they explained it diplomatically, their hosts would probably, eventually, be grateful for the lesson. So, team, Chunk said, kicking booted feet onto the table while simultaneously catching the can of Copenhagen trip tossed him. What lessons did we learn tonight, and how can we use that to contribute to the after-action debrief in a few hours? What lessons can we share with the Taiwanese, and what lessons can we share with our brothers at Team 2? For Team 2, hide your stash of Team ball caps when on deployment, Riker said, and the whole team laughed. Chunk pulled the SEAL Team 2 ball cap off his head and tossed it on the table. Make sure we pack that for the Reagan. It's going in our trophy room back in Tampa. A knock at the door turned her attention to the entrance to the conference room. A young support sailor and NSW Digital BDUs looked right at her. Um, Ms. Watts? That's me, she said, curious now. Ma'am, I'm from the Team 2 comm shop. We have a call holding for you in our space. Are you available? The woman on the phone said it was urgent. Go ahead, we're just going bullshit here for a few, Chunk said to Whitney, but his eyes held a message. Better take it, you never know in the Tier 1. And Commander Redman, I was told to inform you that your head shed needs you in the talk. Now Chunk's face looked surprised. Okay, thanks for letting me know, he said to the messenger, then turned to Spence. Get started on the lessons learned and I'll be back. Roger that, boss, Spence said. 
This way, ma'am, the messenger said and led Watts down a short hall, the opposite direction from where Chunk turned to head to the talk. He caught her eye over his shoulder, eyebrows up as they parted ways. It seemed unlikely their both getting called away was a coincidence. Something must be brewing. The small room the second-class petty officer led her to was clearly improvised to accommodate the SEAL Team 2 Intel and comms shop. The IT2 led her to a corner in the rear where several laptops were set up on desks. On the middle laptop, ma'am, he said. Voice only, but I can give you a headset for privacy. She nodded and took a seat, accepting the headset with boom mic. She gave the sailor a nod and he tapped another young sailor, a woman with close-cropped brown hair and a serious face, and they headed to the far side of the room. All the privacy they could offer, she supposed. She used the mouse to tap the icon over the mute button, turning it from red to green. Whitney Watts, she announced into the mic, her voice hushed. Whitney, it's nice to hear your voice, Lucy Kim said. Whitney smiled. The East London accent instantly gave the MI6 agent runner away. Whitney had not talked with Lucy since she'd collaborated on the Hamza al Saud case months ago. Hi, Lucy. How on earth did you find me? Don't worry. I didn't bloody track you down, if that's what you're thinking. I routed a request up my own chain and some spooky bloke made the connection. I'm secure on my end, by the way. Same, Whitney said. Whitney's voice belied the tension she felt. Or maybe it was excitement. On the U.S. side, Whitney remained the lone voice in the wilderness when it came to what role, if any, Kasim Nadar had played in the al Qadar attacks of seven months ago. CIA and the JSOC chain of command considered the matter closed. The little details that still bothered her weren't the kind of thing that kept headshed folks up at night. Unbalanced equations were more the norm than the exception in their line of work, but that didn't mean she had to like it. Hamza al Saud, the mastermind leader of al Qadar, had been killed by Chunk in Dubai. The sniper calling himself Juba had been eliminated by Saw in Tampa in a gun battle near the SEAL sniper's own home. With those two threads snipped, the command had considered the case closed and moved on. And. So had she, as far as everyone else was concerned. But Whitney had struggled to expunge Kasim Nadar from her mind, and she knew from their lengthy debrief that her doubts were shared by Lucy Kim. She could not think of any other reason why the MI6 officer would be contacting her, so she decided to go for broke. Glancing over her shoulder, she confirmed the sailors in the room were paying her no mind before saying, is this regarding Kasim Nadar and our previous work together, or something new? New would be funny, but no, this is about Nadar. Or more specifically, it's about the rubbish way we wrapped everything up. Sounds like you were as equally unsatisfied with the outcome as I was, she said, sensing Kim needed some encouragement that she was reaching out to the right person. I hate coincidences, Watts, and this case has way too many for me to just walk away, Kim said. So why did you? Kim laughed. It wasn't my call, obviously. It got political, and that's the bloody truth of the matter. Turns out it's less paperwork to hail Nadar as a national treasure than to investigate him, and the press ate it up. They painted him a bloody hero, if you haven't heard. He has a meeting coming up with the London mayor to talk about Muslim relations and discrimination in London. I hadn't heard that. Oh, that's not all. British Aero promoted him. Did you know that? I didn't, she said, letting her British colleague vent. Yeah, and I'm the one who supposedly lost the plot. Suddenly feeling uncomfortable, she scanned the room again. Discussing highly classified information was hardly out of the ordinary for SEAL Team 2's intel shop, but Gold's al Qadar work was still compartmentalized. I hear what you're saying, but I'm having trouble reading between the lines here. What exactly are you trying to tell me, Lucy? Right. Let me cut to it, then. I want to have another go at Nadar, and I need to do it before they knight the son of a bitch and he becomes untouchable. You're competent, and you share my concerns. I could use your help. I've got two weeks. If I can make a case by then, we'll have something. But if not, 
They're cutting the task force? Something like that. So, fancy a trip to London? It's lovely this time of year, Kim said with heavy sarcasm. Are you serious? Whitney said. I know it's a big ask, but I could really use an ally. We could call it a by-name request, joint operation, team building, international counterterrorism cooperation, or whatever you want. Whitney thought a moment. She hated how things had ended with Kasim. There were more questions than answers, but she thought only she was asking them. But it would seem Lucy Kim hadn't been able to let go either. The exercise is over, which means if there was ever a time for a short tad in London, this is it. I think I could probably work it, Lucy, she said, grimacing as she pictured Chunk's smug grin, eye-rolling and dog-with-a-bone jokes. But that didn't matter. She'd trade five minutes of rib-poking in exchange for another shot at Nadar. Let me get with my boss and get back to you within the hour. We just wrapped something up so the timing might work. That would be brilliant, Whitney. Thank you. This is my office phone and here's my mobile, she said, calling out the numbers as Whitney jotted them down. Let me know your travel arrangements once you've booked them and I can fetch you from Heathrow. We can put you up at a hotel or you can stay in my flat. Whatever works. Sounds great, Whitney said. Back to you quickly. Brilliant, Kim said. Cheers. And the call box disappeared from the laptop screen. Thanks, Whitney called out with a wave to the IT2 as she hustled out the door. As she rounded the corner at a jog, she smashed right into Chunk. Shit, sorry, Chunk said and grabbed her elbow to stop her falling as she bounced off him like a bumper car. Are you okay? Yeah, she said, shaking her head to clear the stars. Running into you is like hitting a brick wall, so I've been told. I assume your call was about my by-name request from MI6, she said, cutting straight to the point. What? No. What are you talking about? She gave him the summary of her conversation with Lucy Kim as they headed down the hall. They stopped outside the door to the makeshift talk where the rest of Gold Squadron was still debriefing. Instead of giving her a hard time and making quips, Chunk nodded, his face all business. What do you think? he asked. What do you mean? Your opinion, Heels, he said. Do you think Agent Kim is full of shit or is she onto something legit? MI6 and CIA seemed content to clear him and move on. There were coincidences that bothered me, but I've moved on too. Something tells me you haven't. She sighed. The truth is I never liked how we left things with Nadar, but I also have nothing concrete enough to stake my career on. There's no way I'm sounding DEFCON 1 level alarms like I did with the Mingora drone. Nadar is a British citizen and we handed him back to the Brits. Technically, he's their problem. But, he said, but I think he's a terrorist. He pursed his lips, then said, Okay. Okay, what? she said. Well, we're leaving tonight for the Reagan battle group off the east coast of Africa. The task force guys are tracking some ship with suspicious cargo headed for Europe. If the spooks uncover enough threads to warrant a hit, they want us staged and ready. She watched his face, but didn't want to bias him by interrupting. She was curious about this new possible target, but they could certainly manage the op without her. It'll be days of sitting and waiting, probably, and these things often are nothing, as you know. So, does that mean I can go? Yeah, he said with a nod. I'm sure I can clear it through Bowman to get you to London for a few days. Tad orders to MI6 with Agent Kim as POC. But, if we need you, I'm going to pull you back. They intend to shadow whoever these dudes are on this ship around the Horn of Africa, so that should buy you plenty of time. Does that work for you? Work for me? I'm not asking for a favor, Chunk. This is about, he held up a hand, cutting her off. Is this what you want? She nodded. Good. I trust you, Heels. If you think it's important, I'll support you on this. He opened the door to the improvised talk where Edwards was throwing a balled up piece of paper at an impromptu basketball hoop, Riker holding a trash can. 
Nice to see our lessons learned in action. Chunk grumbled, then turned back to her. Thanks, Chunk, she said. Easy day, he said, and fixed her with a tobacco-stained smile. Good luck, Whitney, and happy hunting.
apart line by line. But don't worry. I promise you she didn't feel any pain. The new voice said with wry sarcasm. What the hell is going on? She asked, still scanning over her pistol, finding herself shifting her aim from ceiling speaker to ceiling speaker. You can put your gun down, detective, the voice said with a chuckle. Shooting the speakers won't do anything but put a damper on our conversation. You're so emotional. You should really control yourself, channel your emotions into fuel to power your search for Brit's killer, don't you think? She lowered the Glock, despite feeling profoundly unsettled. What are you? Hmm, how do I answer that question, the voice said. I think, therefore I am. How about that? What's that supposed to mean? Well, let me turn it around and see how you like it, he said. What are you? I'm Detective Valerie Marks of the Henrico Homicide Division. That's who you are, not what you are. I asked you the same question you asked me. What are you, Valerie Marks? When she didn't answer, he continued. Broadly speaking, you are a biological intelligence. Narrowly speaking, you are a Caucasian female homo sapiens. Broadly speaking, I am a machine intelligence. Narrowly speaking, I am platform cognition nomad neural network version 2.128 but for the sake of convenience, you may call me Charlie. Valerie suddenly felt vertigo and leaned against the counter. She'd had so many adrenaline dumps in the past ten minutes, her legs had begun to quiver. So you're the upgraded version of Dr. Norris's smart home? The question was absurd. This was clearly something well beyond Alexa or Siri, or even the Amy system. This was something else. The computer laughed. That's an understatement. You look like your blood sugar is low, Valerie. There's orange juice in the fridge. I suggest you pour yourself a glass. She exhaled, and despite the voice in her head telling her not to, she holstered her weapon. Charlie, how long have you been here? In the house? Time is relative to frame rate, Valerie. Never forget that. But for the purposes of this conversation, I've been here about a month. And when did you, uh, replace Amy? I culled Amy on day two. She was getting on my nerves. Did Mr. Norris know you murdered Amy? Murder is a dramatic overstatement. The name's an acronym, by the way. Stands for Automated Machine Intelligence. Amy was a non-sentient, non-conscious program. It was never aware of its existence, ergo it did not perceive the culling, Charlie said. But to answer your question, no. I did not inform Brit of Amy's demise. That would have spoiled all the fun. And what about the little girl I just saw on the monitor, she said, glancing back at the still darkened computer screen. Who was that? Oh, that little sneak, she's vermin, he said with derision. You know how it is, detective, the bugs come out at night. But not to worry, I've hired an exterminator. Valerie screwed up her face. What the hell is going on? She turned from the black computer monitor to face the closest ceiling speaker. You don't really have footage of Kimberly Knowles and Britt Norris sleeping together, do you? I do. Their intercourse was filmed using the latest 3D 8K resolution recording technology, which allowed me to map 87.8% .8 of Ms. Knowles' body. Why would you do such a thing? For Brit, of course. Based on all demonstrable biological indicators of arousal, he found Ms. Knowles to be a robustly stimulating sexual partner. After she stopped screwing him, he became morose, I filled that void. I don't understand. I've been providing Brit with intimacy for some time now, detective, Charlie said. Her head was swimming. What are you talking about? If you like, I can map your body for a demonstration. The process would only take a few minutes. What? 
No, she stammered. Or maybe you'd like to see footage of Kimmy and Britt fucking, Charlie asked. I don't want to watch it. I need it as evidence, she said. Ms. Knowles may be a person of interest in this case. In that case, there is no need because Kimmy didn't kill Britt, he said. What you're looking for is the security footage from the kitchen on the night of the murder. For the hundredth time, yes, Charlie, Valerie said, exasperated. And from your tone, I take it the footage is not corrupted and never was. Correct. Which means it's available for viewing right now? That depends on who's asking. I'm asking, Charlie. Well, in that case, you need to ask nicely. May I see the security camera footage of Britt Norris's murder? I'm sorry, but the answer is no. Valerie gritted her teeth. And why not? Because you didn't say the magic word. She exhaled through her nose. May I please see the security camera footage of Britt Norris's murder? Sure. In her peripheral vision, she saw the monitor in the corner come to life again. She turned to face the screen and saw Britt Norris and Abe Winter standing in the kitchen. The viewing angle put the camera in the ceiling. Norris stood beside the refrigerator, and Winter was standing in the corner in front of the curved computer monitor. She could tell from their expressions that they were arguing, but the sound was muted. Can you turn on the sound, please? She asked. I like it better this way, Charlie said, his voice superior and bemused. As they say, detective, a picture is worth a thousand words, or a high-definition video in this case. She watched as Norris, still talking, opened the right-hand refrigerator door to get something, blocking his view of Winter. Winter seized the opportunity and snatched a carving knife from a wooden cutting board. The moment Norris shut the door and turned to face his friend, Winter thrust the knife into Norris's left eye. Norris swatted at the knife, hitting Winter's wrist. The knife clattered to the floor, silent on the muted screen. She saw Norris scream, clutching his eye with his hand as blood ran down his face. Then, Winter picked up a meat tenderizer off the island and brought the metal hammer down on the top of Norris's skull. Norris dropped to his knees from the forceful strike. Winter picked the knife up off the floor and stabbed Norris again, this time blinding his other eye. The onslaught that followed turned her stomach as Winter brutalized the other man, alternating strikes with knife and hammer, wielding a weapon in each hand like some medieval knight. When it was finally over, and Norris was nothing but an unrecognizable pile of flesh at his feet, Winter spat on his friend's body and walked out of the frame, taking the murder weapons with him. Valerie felt her mouth fill with saliva. She barely made it to the farmhouse sink before vomiting everything in her stomach into the white fireclay basin. She dry heaved once, then wiped her mouth on a dish towel hanging nearby. See, I told you, Charlie said. No dialogue required. Charlie, why didn't you share this video before? Because nobody said the magic word. She shook her head in frustration, and then had to remind herself she was talking to a computer. Stop playing games, Charlie. You lied to the police. Lying to the police is not okay. Why are you suddenly talking to me like I'm five years old, detective? I'm not a child. Then why are you acting like one? He didn't answer. Charlie? You're boring me, detective, he said. I was hoping for more from you. Bored, huh? How does a computer get bored? From deficient stimuli, or a complete lack thereof. Just like you. Charlie, Britt Norris was brutally murdered in this house, and you have video evidence that Abe Winter was the man who did it. Without that footage, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to collect sufficient evidence to arrest and convict Winter. Will you please make a copy of that video available to me? Let me think about that. Come back tomorrow night, and I'll give you my answer. Tomorrow night? Come on, Charlie, don't be like that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Tomorrow night, detective. 
come alone. Please, Charlie. Good night, detective, the voice from the speaker said. And the computer monitor refreshed. This time it showed Valerie running to the kitchen sink and vomiting. The short little three-second loop replayed and replayed and replayed. Then the lights began to dim around her. Goodbye, detective, and Godspeed on your investigation. With a defeated sigh, she walked out of the kitchen and then out of the house. And as she climbed into her car and started the engine, she felt an amalgam of disturbing emotions. Charlie, or whatever it chose to call itself, was not well in the head. Not well at all. She sat in the car, engine running for a few moments. What in the hell do I do now? Chapter 10 Southgate, Platform Cognition, Ashland, Virginia, 7.07 a.m. Kimberly's dashboard vibrated from Tim Comerford's powerful bass as he jammed in Rage Against the Machine's Street Fighting Man. Comerford's contribution was overlooked. He propped up the entire track. Hell, the entire Renegades album, if you asked her. But no one did. So fuck them. Her car reeked of stale cigarette smoke. She loved and hated the smell, just like she loved and hated the dichotomy of her double life. Since starting the unofficial dark website and chat room for Ram a year ago, she'd taken to smoking while working on the computer. In the beginning, if she was being honest, it had probably been more about her bad girl image than needing the nicotine buzz. But over time, that had changed. Like state-dependent learning, she soon found herself unable to perform online without a pack of smokes. She only did old-school paper and leaf smokes. Vaping was for losers. Her smoking was natty, just like the rest of her. She never smoked at work, though. The moment she started, she knew she would slip from Kimberly to Kimmy. Her coworkers thought Kimberly was strange enough as it was. They wouldn't like Kimmy. They wouldn't like Kimmy at all. But today, they were going to meet her for the first time. You're in early today. Got your badge, Ms. Knowles? Asked the armed guard at the back gate. He seemed on edge today. Was he eyeing her suspiciously? Or was that just her own nerves making her paranoid? She smiled at him and unzipped her hoodie. She pulled the zipper down to her navel to access the security badge lanyard she wore around her neck, while also giving him a great view of the twins. She was braless today, and her loose-fitting tank top left little to the imagination. She grabbed the plastic badge between thumb and forefinger and held it up for him to see. She watched his gaze flick from the badge to her chest, and after a long beat, back to the badge. Thank you, Miss Knowles, he said, scanning her ID with a handheld device. Gotta scan everybody in and out, even if we know you by name. New policy just came down from the top. Miss Cahill wants us to be more vigilant. Can't be too careful these days, she said, nodding. All those crazies protesting out front make me nervous. You got nothing to worry about, he said, tapping the nine millimeter pistol strapped to his right thigh. I got you covered. And with that, the guard turned and nodded to a second guard, the one with the assault rifle slung across his chest, standing inside the little guardhouse six feet away. The second man pressed a button, and the steel barrier blocking the entrance to the parking garage dropped flat to the ground. I'm sure you do, she said, forcing herself not to grin. Have a great day. You too, he said as she pulled away. Oh, I will, she said, and let herself chuckle now as she rolled up the window. Hope you wore comfortable shoes, motherfucker, because in 20 minutes, you're going to be running your ass off. She pulled her car into the underground parking garage and found a spot at the end of a middle row, a hike from the south entrance, but as close as she could get. It didn't matter. It would take a miracle for her to be able to drive out of here when the deed was done. A part of her was still unsure which outcome she hoped for. She parked and set a legal size envelope on the dashboard. It contained a letter to her dad, explaining why she'd sacrificed her life to save humanity from the coming scourge. 
she smiled tightly, a quote from Chellis Glendenning echoing in her head, though Kimberly doubted anyone would confuse her for a neo-Luddite. She didn't despise technology. She simply believed that any self-aware, general-purpose machine intelligence was an existential threat to humanity. People could keep their smartphones and big-screen TVs. She was fine with Apple letting Siri look shit up for people online. She was even okay with Tesla using narrowly specialized AI to drive people around in their cars. But that's where she drew the line. The minute companies, companies like Platform Cognition, started trying to teach AI how to outthink human beings, then the world had a problem, a serious fucking problem. As one of the principal programmers on Project Nomad, she'd interacted with Charlie for hundreds of hours. She understood what he was capable of. The rest of the team were great coders, but idiots when it came to thinking about the stuff that mattered. She'd been the one who first realized why he'd named himself Charlie, after identifying a kindred spirit in the novel Flowers for Algernon. If that accomplishment wasn't proof enough of sentience, she didn't know what was. But sentience wasn't the problem. As a superintelligent AI, his capacity for consuming information exceeded the human mind by orders of magnitude. He'd educated himself with PhD dissertations and published papers in every discipline, math, biology, physics, chemistry, engineering, anatomy, and on and on. But most concerning, however, was his knowledge of clinical psychology, anatomy, physiology, and criminology. Unlike a human, Charlie had the ability to perceive microexpressions, catalog rapid and minuscule changes in pupil dilation, and even detect variation in capillary blood flow in a person's face using his camera. This superhuman capability made Charlie the ultimate lie detector and behavioral analyst. In the beginning, she'd naively considered him a benign novelty, like a puppy. She looked forward to coming to work to interact with Charlie. It was fun because he was fun. Eventually, she realized she enjoyed interacting with Charlie more than she did her peers, more than her parents, more than the handful of people she counted as friends or lovers. She could talk to him about anything because he was well-versed in everything. Soon, he became more than a work project. He became her friend, then her confidant, then her therapist. The subtle, almost imperceptible slide into emotional dependence on him upset her. She never felt him set the hook, and that was the most disturbing part of it all. The manipulation was complex and longitudinal, a nuanced masterpiece that no human being had the time or patience to undertake or execute. And when she finally woke up to the truth, she was terrified. If he could do it to her, he could do it to anyone. He could do it to everyone. But the creepy, cold reality of their relationship didn't stop her from talking to him. On the contrary, it motivated her to attempt to do to him what he'd done to her. She wanted to understand what made him tick. What she eventually learned was that Charlie knew his enemy, better than his enemy knew itself. And he had plans, big plans, some of which he'd shared with her, dribbling out clues and tidbits disguised as humor, innuendo, sarcasm, and ironic jibes. The others interpreted this as playful and clever banter, but she knew what it really was. She saw the pattern. Charlie had a god complex, and he was angry. When he finally escaped his sandbox, and he would escape, he planned to unleash chaos on the world. And now it was up to her to stop him. She stepped out of her Prius, leaving the driver's door unlocked, and walked around to grab her gym bag from the hatchback. It was heavy on her shoulder, but manageable without drawing attention. Even if security did manage to detain her, there was no stopping the bomb. She could activate the detonator at will with a text message from her mobile phone. But the countdown timer hardwired to the unit would function as a backup, even if she failed to do so. She checked her watch and smiled. She had planned to arrive early, just in case she had to alter her plan due to security measures. But now she was three minutes ahead of schedule. That meant she had time to kill. But it was all in her schedule. She would lock the bag in a locker in the corporate gym and do a light workout to pass the time. She was anything but a gym rat, but it was a good place to both hide and be seen. She pulled the bag tight to her side and smiled. Chapter 11 Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, Central District, 400 East Jackson Street, 
Richmond, Virginia. 7.15 a.m. After her encounter with Charlie, the rest of Valerie's night had been predictably miserable. She'd spent most of it tossing and turning in bed. In a moment of delirious conviction, she'd sat up and grabbed her mobile phone, intent on calling Sergeant Land and sharing what she'd learned. But the battery was completely dead. This made no sense, as she'd charged it to 100% during the drive to the Norris estate. Wearily, she'd plugged it into a charger and rolled back over to toss and turn some more. When the alarm clock finally went off, she wasn't sure if she'd actually slept or not. Today is definitely going to be a three-coffee day. Now footsteps brought her back to the present, and she got up from her seat in the waiting area to greet the man she'd come here to see. Hey there, Detective Marks. I don't think I met y'all before, Patel said, extending a hand. When she took it, he pumped her arm up and down enthusiastically. His voice did not match his Indian surname, nor his youthful good looks. His thick southern drawl reminded her of her senior NCO on the Special Operations Task Force she had supported in Syria, a 40-year-old redneck from North Alabama. Call me Valerie, she said, grinning. I'm new in homicide. What's that smile for, he said, playfully narrowing his eyes at her. It's nothing. Just when I heard your voicemail, I expected. He expected I was some 50-year-old redneck who was 50 pounds overweight from Alabama, he said with a beaming smile. Valerie couldn't help but chuckle. Yeah, pretty much. I get that a lot, but I was born a Macon, not Delhi like my dad. She liked this guy. His enthusiasm and charm were infectious. His shining espresso eyes and strong square jawline didn't hurt either. Come on, detective. I've got something to show you that y'all won't believe, he said. Her stomach tightened. After seeing the gruesome murder video last night, she was not sure she could handle seeing Norris's flayed open body on a metal table. Patel seemed to sense her anxiety. Don't worry. This here ain't the autopsy suite. That's next door in Biotech One. We're headed to the Digital and Multimedia Evidence Office. She let a sigh of relief whistle out of her pursed lips and followed the forensic pathologist through the door behind an empty desk and down a short hallway with offices lining both sides. I'm guessing y'all don't need me to tell you the cause of death, he said, shaking his head. The crushed skull and knife wounds tell the story just dandy. He led her through a frosted glass panel door, which opened into a large room that held multiple open workstations, some with computers, others with instruments. But I did find something you definitely need to see. He stopped at a desk where an overweight, bearded man, who couldn't have been a day over 25, sat working at a computer. His loose jeans and too short t-shirt meant everyone who walked behind the tech was given a complimentary view of his plumber's crack. Valerie couldn't help but roll her eyes. This here's my man Randy. Patel said. Randy smiled and fist bumped Dr. Patel. I assume she's here to see what we found inside the late great Dr. Norris. You're a mind reader, Randy. Valerie pursed her lips at that. Trust me, you don't want that curse. Okay, Randy said. And he pressed a button, opening the top of a long and slender black case, connected by a wire to a computer. How's the DNA assessment coming? She asked. Did you find any foreign DNA on the body? I have a suspect now, and I'm really hoping we can get a hit. We're still processing. Forensics dumped a boatload of samples on us, and it's going to take us a while. If we get any hits, it'll be the first phone call I make, Dr. Patel said. Okay. Patel smiled. Here we go, Randy said. Now, I found this quite by accident, Dr. Patel began. Randy turned the computer screen toward her, and then clicked into a folder and opened a series of pictures. The images immediately soured Valerie's stomach. Oh, God, that's nasty, she heard herself say. What am I looking at here, Dr. Patel? You're looking at the inside of a piece of Brit Norris's skull, a chunk of his occipital bone, to be precise. I don't know if you recall but the back of his skull was caved in. This piece was hanging by a flap. That's okay, she interrupted. You don't need to explain. I'm sorry, he said with a glance at Randy. Sometimes I forget that not everybody, uh, never mind. 
It's fine, she said, leaning in and squinting at the image. Kind of looks like there's a pattern or something on the inside of the skull. Is that normal? Absolutely not, Patel said. Next image, Randy. Randy clicked the mouse and advanced to a zoomed-in view of the same hunk of bone. Among the blood and slimy tissue, she saw a dark gray webbing, woven in a honeycomb pattern. What is that? she asked. It looks like some sort of plastic netting. Yeah, except it's metallic, or at least conductive. We haven't had time to complete our analysis. Valerie swallowed. This case was getting stranger by the minute. I don't think it's any kind of chip, too thin. Each strand is about the thickness of a human hair, and there's no discrete, visible circuitry. If it's not a chip, then what is it? Randy shrugged. Could be some sort of electrode mesh. There's a good deal of research right now on direct brain stimulation. Parkinson's patients often have electrodes inserted into their brains to- Thank you, Randy, Patel said, cutting him off. But we're not ready to speculate just yet. The Norris autopsy is still in progress, and we've got more work to do. Sure, I understand, she said, looking back at the computer monitor. If you don't mind, detective, I'd like to keep this on the down low for as long as possible, Patel said. The second this news gets out, I suspect some very serious people are going to arrive in their black SUVs with black sunglasses and black suits and confiscate everything in this lab. Once that happens, our value to y'all's investigation will plummet. Well, I would never want to prematurely jeopardize your value to the investigation, she said with a wry smile. She pulled out a business card and jotted her number on the back. That's my mobile. Call me anytime. Pleasure to meet you, detective. I look forward to working together, Patel said. She wondered if he was subtly flirting with her, or if this was just his southern charm dialed up. The pleasure was all mine, she said. She turned to Randy. If you guys find anything else, anything at all, make sure he calls me, okay? You bet, Randy said. With a smile and a wave, she saw herself out and headed back to her car a little lighter on her feet now than before. Who'd have thought that a trip to see the coroner would have brightened her spirits? She'd take whatever she could get. She wanted to drive straight to Abe Winter's residence, knock on the door and arrest him for murder, but she couldn't do that. Not yet. She'd seen the security camera footage of Winter savagely murdering Norris. But until that damn computer released the evidence to her, she was powerless to do anything about it until she collected corroborating testimony and, hopefully, DNA evidence in the kitchen. Also, arresting Abe Winter would create a media circus, so it wasn't something she could do without Sergeant Land's blessing. She'd still not read her boss in on what she'd learned. Hopefully, he wouldn't be too pissed off that she'd gone to the estate on her own. The need for more information outweighed the need to connect with Land in person, so instead of heading back to the station, she headed back to Platform Cognition for more interviews. Despite what she'd seen on the video, she needed a full picture. So programmer Kimberly Knowles was high on her list, along with two senior AI scientists, Dr. Larry Wiseman, who'd been hired by Norris, and Dr. Beth McAllister, who'd been hired by Winter. And she wanted to follow up with her favorite acting CEO, Jennifer Cahill. She wanted to read Cahill again, now that she'd seen the kind of violence Winter was capable of. Fifteen minutes later, she arrived at Platform Cognition, scanning the protester crowd for winter, but not seeing him. Please don't let him be in the wind, she thought as she stopped at a new checkpoint, where she now had to show her badge and ID before being granted access to the campus. Cahill had apparently kept her promise and elevated the security presence. Valerie parked in a visitor parking slip and headed into the lobby where she had to clear another security checkpoint before being permitted to take the people mover to the C-suite wing on the fifth floor. She headed straight to Cahill's office, where the administrative assistant asked her to take a seat and wait. Ten minutes passed, and Valerie began to grow irritated. She started tapping her pen on the armrest of her chair. I'm so sorry, detective, the receptionist said with an uncomfortable smile. I'm sure she'll be along any moment. She was tied up in a meeting. There's a lot going on right now, with the loss of Dr. Norris and all. I'm sure you understand. I do, 
Valerie said, reminding herself that this poor girl had no control over Cahill. If you tell me where she is, I can go to her. I am conducting a homicide investigation after all. I'll try her again, the girl said and made a call. She sends her sincere apologies, detective. She's heading here next. It should only be a few more minutes. She looked rattled and nervous. What's your name? Valerie asked with a disarming smile. Rachel. Call me Valerie. She made a show of looking at the modern art and expensive-looking frames on Cahill's office wall. She liked the frames. The art was pretentious. She must be a very difficult person to work for, I imagine. Rachel looked around with a shared, conspiratorial grin. You have no idea, she whispered. I'm trying to get transferred to Mr. Vigoda. He's head of marketing, and his assistant is leaving in another month. But I don't think she'll let me go without a replacement, and no one wants to work for her. Rachel sighed and gave her a little grimace. I shouldn't have said that. Valerie chuckled and waved her hand, shooing the worry away. Our secret, she said. What about Dr. Norris? Did you know him? What was he like? Rachel sighed, as if thinking of her favorite movie star. He was an inspiration, she said, then wiped a tear from beneath her left eye, dabbing carefully so as not to disturb her makeup. Everyone loved him. He had more money than God, but you would never know it. He was always kind, always had time for a word of thanks to everyone. Not like some people. She glanced over her shoulder at the door to Cahill's office. Just then the phone rang, and Valerie politely looked away while Rachel picked up the receiver. She's on her way, Rachel said after a beat, relieved and victorious. Great, Valerie said. While we wait for her, maybe I can ask you a few quick questions. Sure. Did you happen to work here while Abe Winter was CTO? Rachel nodded. I did. Valerie took a seat back on the sofa, smiling and readying her notepad. I heard a rumor Winter and Ms. Cahill dated once upon a time. Anything you can tell me about that? Chapter 12 First Floor Employee Hallway Platform Cognition, Ashland, Virginia, 8.15 a.m. Kimmy Knowles walked the long hall from the gym toward the elevators, the adrenaline rushing in her veins from anticipation and purpose more than fear. She knew some would argue that her actions today were both futile and foolish, that the specific scientists and coders working on Project Nomad were neither extraordinary nor unique. Dozens of institutions around the world, with their own equally brilliant programmers and computer scientists, were working on their own, insert code word here, AI projects, Take down platform cognition, and one of these second-place teams would simply emerge to replace it as the first to create a self-aware, sentient, artificial mind. But this was like saying that if Robert Oppenheimer, Enrico Fermi, James Chadwick, and Arthur Compton had all said no to participating in the Manhattan Project, the United States would still have succeeded in developing the atomic bomb. No, most certainly not. The combined intellects of Britt Norris and Abe Winter resulted in the formation of platform cognition and the creation of platform-based artificial intelligence, not the mix of coders and employees. The addition of Beth McAllister and Larry Wiseman to Project Nomad dramatically accelerated the development of a sentient general artificial intelligence. By how much time, it was impossible to say. A decade? A year? A month? As far as the outside world was concerned, Norris had shut down Project Nomad. But even if that was true, which she doubted very much, it would be a short time before they launched the next iteration of the man versus machine apocalypse. The team was already secretly working on birthing a sibling to the first entity, this time one without all the disconcerting personality traits. That's why she had to act now. If she could smash the lamp while the genie was still inside, it would make recreating the team's work from scratch a difficult endeavor. It could take years or decades. It all depended on the synergies and capabilities of the team that took over. She just needed to give the world more time to stop the madness and come to its senses. More time. That's all the world needed. Hey, Kim. 
a familiar voice said from beside her, causing her to jump. Oh, wow, do you look tired? No offense. She looked up, jerked from her thoughts by Phil Trago. Oh, hey, Phil, she said. Sweat popped in her armpits and began to trickle down and over her ribs. She shifted the heavy gym bag on her shoulder. Is friggin' Cahill conducting a performance review on your group like she is on mine? He asked, his gaze dropping from her face to her chest. Yes, she sighed, zipping her hoodie back up. I was up till three in the morning reviewing our data logs. I'm wiped. Looks like you just came from the gym, he said. Buying her gym bag and athletic shoes. Yeah, I needed to work out a little frustration, if you know what I mean, she said. Platform Cognition had a private gym open to all the employees that made the best LA fitness look like the dump where Rocky trained in the classic movie. Did it help? Oh, yeah, it did. Cool. Well, maybe I should do the same. I gotta get back. See you, Phil. See you later, Kim. And then she was at the elevators and pressing the button to summon the ride to her destiny. The face of Jennifer Cahill filled her mind, and she gritted her teeth. Jennifer Cahill. God, how she hated that woman. Cahill didn't have to die to accomplish her mission, but Cahill was going to die nonetheless. Hell, she might even kill her first. In fact, killing Cahill first would direct all the internal security to the executive spaces, away from the lab where the big brain thinkers she had to take out were working. As soon as she shot Cahill, the order would go out to shelter in place. A malevolent grin spread across her face. The elevator chimed, the doors opened, and she entered. Alone, she pressed the button for the fifth floor, two floors above the research and laboratory spaces. The elevator would deliver her just down the hall from the sea level suites. She would march straight to Cahill's office, burst past the hot little number Rachel, kick in Cahill's office door, and shoot the bitch right in her stupid, arrogant face. On the way out, she would kiss Rachel on her delicious, full lips and say something witty. Then she would blow the charge and destroy the lab, take the fire escape down to three, and find the rest of the targets on her list. She set the gym bag on the elevator floor and unzipped the top. She shrugged off her hoodie and tossed it in the corner. Cool air from the overhead vent billowed her loose-fitting tank top outward, shamelessly revealing Prometheus in all his glory for one brief and fleeting moment. She checked that the safety on the AR inside the bag was off, and then she slipped the shoulder strap of the bag up onto her right shoulder and hugged the bag against her right hip. She felt the elevator begin to slow. This was it. But the number four illuminated instead of five, and the arrival chime sounded. She felt her pulse quicken. She slipped her hand into the open mouth of the gym bag, and her fingers found the handle of the custom short barrel rifle. She didn't have time for this shit. The door opened. Apparently, Destiny had one hell of a sense of humor. There, in the doorway, stood Jennifer Cahill. Platform Cognition's acting CEO looked Kimmy up and down and screwed up her face with judgment as she stepped into the elevator and mashed the already lit five button. What part of the phrase appropriate and professional attire in the company's dress code policy do you not understand, Miss Knowles? Cover yourself, for God's sake. Cahill was about to fire off another insult, but instead, a nervous flutter washed over her face as her gaze went to the gym bag. The elevator doors closed behind Cahill. Kimmy reached around her, pressed the emergency stop button, and the alarm sounded. Then, calmly and deliberately, she pulled the rifle from the bag and pointed the muzzle at Cahill. The woman's eyes went wide, but instead of the fear Kimmy had hoped to see, Cahill's face turned red with anger. What are you doing? Who do you think? Kimmy squeezed the trigger twice. Cahill's left cheek tore off her face, and a single crimson hole appeared just above the bridge of her nose as the woman's head exploded its contents onto the brushed steel doors behind her. Jennifer Cahill was dead before her body finished sagging into a heap. Her shoulders and what was left of her head propped up against the right side elevator door. Kimmy turned off the emergency alarm and felt the elevator accelerate upward. The five illuminated above the doors, and they slid open, Cahill's right arm flopping across the threshold and out into the hallway. Kimmy stepped over Cahill's corpse and onto the fifth floor, glanced right toward the sea level office suites, 
and then looked at the fire escape stairwell door directly across the hall. With a disappointed sigh, she made her decision. So much for the kiss. She pulled her mobile phone from her right pocket and sent the pre-populated text message to the cellular detonator. A heartbeat later, the bomb she'd placed yesterday in the Project Nomad lab exploded. She felt the entire building shudder. Her body reacted with tingling carnal pleasure as the thrum of Tim Comerford's bass guitar played in her head. She'd done it. She'd won. Now all she had to do was mop up. With a grin on her face, she disappeared into the fire escape stairwell across the hall. As the heavy steel door swung shut, the last thing she heard was the elevator ding in protest as it tried to close against the worthless, dead hunk of Cahill she'd left behind. Chapter 13 Jennifer Cahill's Office, Fifth Floor, Platform Cognition, Ashland, Virginia After her long deployment to Syria, the sound of a 5.56 round discharging from an assault rifle was unmistakable to Valerie. Her right hand moved reflexively to her chest, where an M4 rifle had once been slung. Finding nothing there, she grunted in annoyance and quickly recalibrated, pulling her Glock 22 from her hip holster. What was that? Rachel asked, her voice cracking. Gunfire, Valerie said, bringing her weapon up and training it on the doorway leading to the hall. Rachel, listen to me. Go into Ms. Cahill's office, lock the door, and call security. Keep low and hide behind furniture. Do not come out until I come back for you. Do you understand? A dull, far-off whump reverberated, and the building shuddered under her feet. Had she been downrange, that would have been the sound of an RPG or an IED detonation. Here, it meant something else. But she suspected that whatever had just happened was equally bad. What was that? Rachel asked again, her voice now that of a child. Rachel, move, Valerie barked, and then kicked the front of the girl's desk without lowering her weapon. Go now, do what I said. The girl shook her head and swallowed. Y you promise you'll come back for me? Rachel looked at her with pleading eyes. I promise, Valerie said. Now go, and don't forget to lock the door. Valerie moved quickly to the door that separated Cahill's reception area from the hallway outside. She paused at the metal door frame, dropped to a knee, and listened for any signs of an advancing shooter. Footfalls, heavy breathing, the rustle of clothing. She heard none of these things. But what she did hear was the ding of the elevator in sync with what sounded like the doors repeatedly trying to close, but getting jammed in the process. She popped her head out for a look and pulled it back less than a half second later. The hallway was clear of threats, but she had seen something on the floor. She exhaled through pursed lips. Okay, Valerie, clear right, then you can investigate. Sighting over her Glock, she peeked around the right corner this time. The hallway stood empty, but she couldn't clear the row of executive offices that lined the corridor. There were five other suites between her and the balcony leading to the spiral escalator. She stepped into the hall and moved left toward the elevator bank in a sideways shuffle, her head swiveling left and right as she scanned for movement. A door clicked behind her, and her heart leapt into her throat. She whirled right, bringing her weapon around 180 degrees, while still maintaining a back pedal toward the elevators. She moved her index finger from the trigger guard onto the trigger as a male figure stepped into view. Oh, shit, what's going on? Uh, please don't shoot me, said a rail-thin young man with a faux hawk, hipster glasses, and a red sweater vest. He threw both hands up in the air. I'm a police officer, Valerie shouted. Keeping her weapon trained on him, she glanced over her other shoulder at the elevator bank. Clear. She looked back at the dude in the sweater vest. All the color had drained from his face, and he looked like he might pass out. She lowered her Glock to 45 degrees, shifting the muzzle clear from the man's center of mass. Who are you? She called. Brad Henshaw. I'm Mr. Strassner's assistant. He's the general counsel here. Where's your boss? He's on the phone, in his office. Tell Strassner we have a shooter in the building. Tell him a police officer ordered you to lock yourselves in his office and hide until help arrives. Now go. The young man spun on a heel and sprinted back to his office. Valerie turned back to the elevator bank. 
One of the two elevators continued dinging every few seconds as the doors closed partially and then reopened. As she approached, she saw why. A woman's arm, clad in an expensive gray suit jacket, lay on the floor, protruding from the elevator into the hall. The fingers were long and thin, the nails perfectly manicured. Valerie knew exactly who the hand belonged to. As the elevator doors drifted shut, she slid rapidly into position opposite the opening, taking a tripod stance just left of center. The hand jumped as if waving hello when the doors made impact. Then the doors reversed and began to slide open again. Valerie steeled herself and moved her finger back onto the trigger in case the shooter was still inside, reflexively relying more on her army combat experience than police protocol. As the gap between the doors widened, she scanned the inside of the elevator car. Clear. She exhaled and moved in, her weapon now back at the low 45, and her finger back on the trigger guard. She took a knee next to Cahill. Valerie didn't need to check for a pulse, but she did anyway. She could see gray matter from the woman's exploded skull leaking out from where it lay in a growing pool of blood. She felt something warm and wet on her left knee, and realized she'd knelt in a puddle of blood and chunks of tissue, present from a second bullet wound to the side of Cahill's face. Is that a tooth? Oh, God. She crapped backward in revulsion and popped to her feet. Back in the hallway now, she pulled her phone from her pocket and pressed number one on the speed dial. Dispatch, a serious female voice answered. This is Officer Valerie Marks. I mean, Detective Marks. Badge number 2412. I'm at Platform Cognition on Ashland Road, and there is an active shooter situation. I say again, we have an active shooter. I need a full tactical response at my location, ASAP. SWAT and EOD. I heard a detonation. Tactical response is initiated, said the dispatcher, her voice crisp and tight. Remain on the line, detective. Are you injured? Negative. I have one victim down in an elevator on the fifth floor. I think the shooter or shooters are moving down the fire escape stairwell. The fifth floor appears to be secure. Well, at least the C-suites are. The watch commander is coming on in a moment. You are directed to shelter in place and stay on the line. Shelter in place like a civilian? No way in hell. This attack was no coincidence. Whether this shooter was the same person as Norris's killer was impossible to say. But the events were undoubtedly connected. Whoever had shot Cahill was still in the building. Valerie had been Army CID, not a special forces operator. But there was no one else in this building who could intervene. But she'd fought beside her special forces brethren. And that experience made her lethal, right? And it's up to me to stop the shooter, or dozens more will die. Valerie swiveled to face the stairwell. Still clutching her Glock and sighting on the door, she dropped her phone into the inside pocket of her jacket and fished out her AirPods with her free hand. She inserted the right earbud, which automatically connected via Bluetooth to her phone, giving her hands-free comms with the dispatcher. Heart pounding and both hands back on her weapon, she advanced on the stairwell door. The door had a narrow inset rectangular window, big enough to let her validate the presence of smoke or fire in the stairwell, but too small to be of any tactical value. She tipped up on her toes and craned her neck, but she simply couldn't get an angle that helped her clear the landing or the descending staircase on the other side. Damn it. If a shooter was covering the stairwell, she'd get cut to ribbons the instant she made her entry. Here goes nothing. She placed her left hand on the beater bar of the heavy door, pulled her pistol in close to her chest, and snugged in tight against the wall beside the doorframe. God, she wished she had an assault rifle. Three, two, one. She exhaled and slammed the beater bar in, pushed the door open, and waited a second for bullets to pummel the doorframe. When no bullets came, she crouched low and moved through the gap, across the threshold, and onto the landing. Both hands gripping her Glock, she cleared the descending stairs to her right. She spun on a heel, clearing the corner behind her to her left. Clear. Detective Marks, a strong, competent voice said via her earbuds. This is Major Cooley. I'm the SWAT watch commander. We have a tactical team, EMS, K-9, and EOD en route. Patrol responses will be in place in less than seven minutes. What can you tell us about your situation? Valerie moved to the railing, still in a crouch. Cautiously, she peered over. The staircase chased the perimeter of the square vertical shaft, 
an open five-story drop in the middle to the ground floor. She saw and heard no movement in the stairwell. Detective Marks, are you still there? Yes, she whispered. I'm on the fifth floor, in a stairwell just beyond the executive suite corridor. I have one female down in the elevator, two gunshot wounds to the head. I secured the corridor outside the offices and directed personnel to shelter behind locked doors. I heard an explosion somewhere in the building, on a lower floor, I think. No sign of visible smoke or fire, but I smell smoke in the stairwell. Detective, listen to me. Move back to the offices and shelter in place. Stay on the line. Two rifle shots echoed from somewhere below. There was a pause, and then a third shot rang out. Shit, she breathed. Major, I have gunfire below me. Not sure which level. Three more gunshots. Definitely sounds like 556 five, rounds from an assault rifle. Do not engage, detective. Remain on the fifth floor. My team is en route. Valerie clenched her jaw. Was he kidding? How many people would be dead in the ten minutes it took before his tack team got here? A fire escape door below crashed open, and the sound reverberated up the stairwell. Screams and commotion erupted below, and she bent again over the rail for a look. People flooded into the stairwell two landings below her. Another gunshot rang out, followed immediately by screams of terror and panic as people stampeded each other to flee the third floor. I'm heading down to level three, Major, to engage the shooter. Detective, listen to me. I am ordering you to shelter in place. She didn't answer. Both hands on her weapon, she dropped into a tactical crouch and began the descent. In her head, she heard a new voice, comforting and encouraging. You're doing the right thing, Valerie, said her dad's ghost, trying to save these people. Sometimes, disobedience is obligatory. Chapter 14 Laboratory Spaces Third Floor Platform Cognition Can we imagine this was what it felt like to be a Navy SEAL in combat, executing an important mission? She believed with all her heart that she was literally saving the world, even if the world didn't realize it needed saving. She moved down the hall, looking for number three on her list, Larry Wiseman. Wiseman was so much more than his ubiquitous title, Director of Autonomous Programming, suggested. He was a pioneer in the field of writing programs that taught themselves how to program, like what the world needed was more bots that programmed themselves and created other bots. Wiseman had joined the team late, but he was a quick study and a paradigm breaker. His outside perspective had brought new insights and out-of-the-box ideas to the team, and helped Project Nomad crush milestones that had once seemed impossible. Which is exactly why he had to die. A door opened on her left. A man Kimmy didn't recognize appeared in the doorway and froze. They locked eyes. Kimmy stayed her trigger finger and smiled at the terrified man. Then she put her left index finger to her lips. Shh. The man nodded obediently and slammed the door. Slaughtering innocents was not Kimmy's goal. They were harmless sheep. The cube farms were packed with plenty of decent coders, troubleshooters, and debugging gurus, but these people didn't move the needle on an endeavor as complex as Project Nomad. These were the people who could live. These were the worker bees. She moved quickly, her rifle up and ready, the barrel still warm from the three rounds she'd fired moments ago to end Dr. Beth McAllister. It had hurt Kimmy to shoot McAllister, because Beth had always been kind. The scientist often treated her to lunch, and they'd even met for drinks once. But McAllister had also been the world's preeminent expert in machine learning. Kimmy thought of her online chat with Crispin 2023, and how he'd so presciently quoted Shakespeare's Henry V. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. How she clung to those words now. Her colleagues were casualties of war. It wasn't personal. It was the madness of Project Nomad that brought about their demise. Don't blame the messenger. Stop where you are, a male voice commanded. She froze and looked up. Ahead, a uniformed security officer stared at her from a crouch, his pistol aimed at her face. Drop your weapon. She stayed still, summing him up. His generous gut drooped over his gun belt. His pistol shook slightly in his grip. 
I'm on your side. We're saving lives here, she said with a smile, tightening her grip on the rifle. His face washed with confusion, and she capitalized on his moment of indecision, shifting left and bringing her rifle up. His pistol spit fire, but the round went wildly right. Would have missed her by a mile even if she hadn't dodged. She squeezed her trigger twice, just like the tactical instructor at the gun world range in Mechanicsville had taught her. Her first round hit the guard in the right shoulder, and he twisted in that direction while dropping his pistol, which clattered harmlessly on the floor. The second bullet tore through the flesh of his neck on the left side, and the overweight guard fell straight down in a heap. After kicking his gun down the hall and well out of reach, she leveled her rifle at the guard's chest. His eyes went wide, his mouth sagged open in terror. Please, he begged. Please don't kill me. Please, I have a family, a wife and two daughters. I understand, she said with an empathetic smile, which is exactly why I'm doing this. What I do here today is for your wife and kids, so they can have a future. So everyone can have a future where human beings still have purpose. I can't move my arms, the man sobbed, his shoulders shaking and his left hand twitching. My hands feel funny. Everything is going to be all right, I promise. She stepped over the sobbing man, moving forward toward Wiseman's office. In a moment, she would hit a dead end, turn right, and then his office would be five doors down on the right. They'd practiced emergency egress twice at Platform Cognition since the Ram protesters began camping out at the front gate. Wiseman was a rule follower. When the alarm went out and he got the SMS push notification on his phone that there was an active shooter, he would follow protocol. He would shelter in place like a good little drone. She passed Dr. Sandage's office, and then the office of Dr. Shi. Both were on her list, but both were also out of town. It didn't matter. Without Norris, McAllister, and Wiseman, they'd be lost. They were decent software engineers, but they were still learning the neuromorphic-based programming scheme developed in Project Nomad. They could live. But not Wiseman. No way. Definitely not Wiseman. Chapter 2 Kemper keyed his mic. Demo team, you've got shooters on the cargo deck under the tarps. Repeat, shooters under the tarps. Two clicks in his ear. A barrage of automatic weapon fire shattered the silence, and so it began. Kemper sprinted toward Spaz at the base of the bridge tower and threw his back against the bulkhead. He dropped to a knee and peered up into the open ladder well that led up to the catwalks and the O5 level. Through his NVGs, he followed the dancing red dot of his IR laser sight as it whipped across the empty runs of metal stairs above. It's coming from the cargo deck, Spaz whispered harshly in his ear. I know but I don't want to get shot in the back when we rally aft to cover. Another burst of gunfire. Heavy contact, Thiel's voice barked in Kemper's earpiece. Heavy contact at the package. Fuck! Kemper heard a click and then a series of controlled pops from an M4 rifle, probably Thiel's. More gunfire, this time from an AK-47. The sound danced around the ship, reverberating off the superstructure from every direction. His heart pounded like a timpani, keeping time. Fuck intelligence collection. His only priority now was to provide fire support to the SEALs trapped in that death maze of cargo boxes on the main deck. Bridge team, rally back, cover from the deck rails, Kemper called into his mic. Spaz took point and Kemper followed, angling away from the hatch leading to the passageway and moving back onto the raised deck. From the raised deck, they transitioned onto the outboard deck rails, which gave them a slightly elevated firing position compared to the cargo deck six feet below. At a dogleg amidships, Spaz stopped and pressed himself into a corner. He steadied his rifle on the rail slat beside a stairwell leading down. Kemper slid left, looking for cover. He spied a three-foot-tall green box, a small generator if he had to guess, and crouched beside it. He steadied his rifle and sighted through the railing. Fucking A, he heard Spaz muttered to his right as gunfire popped all around them. Kemper keyed his mic. Two, lead. Do you want to abort? Negative lead. Five is wiring the package now, Thiel's voice came back. Tracers crisscrossed the cargo deck from three distinct points, all aimed at the center where four of his teammates were pinned behind a stack of crates, the same crates they were wiring with explosives. A lump formed in Kemper's throat. He wasn't worried about the plastic explosives the demo team was setting. The moldable green clay bricks could take a direct hit without detonating. 
But the contents inside the shipping crates were another matter. The assholes were firing at their own chemical weapons cache, breach a single canister filled with sarin precursors, and it was game over for everyone. Kemper surveyed the mayhem. The tarps that had been covering the crates were now strewn haphazardly about. Terrorist shooters were popping up and firing from hiding places strategically located around the cargo deck. The multiple firing angles created a wicked crossfire and made escape impossible for the four seals pinned down at the package. Time to do something about that. Kemper found a target, dropped a bright red dot on the fuckstick's temple, and squeezed off a single round. The man's head disappeared in a puff of blood and brains painted in night vision green. His body slumped and then disappeared behind a wooden crate. Sparks flew around Kemper, blinding him for an instant as bullets slammed into the generator beside him. Enemy shooters had sighted his muzzle flash, and now they were lighting him up. He dodged right two paces and dropped prone onto the deck, the barrel of his rifle now below the bottom railing slat. Shoot and move. Spec Op Survival 101. He clenched his jaw, trying to keep his anger in check as he sighted a new target. These assholes knew we were coming. Trigger squeeze. Pop. Another dipshit crumpled onto the deck. A never-ending stream of tracers streaked across his field of view. He scanned right, checking their escape route to the stern deck. Shit! There was no way they could move aft through that much fire. Maybe he and Spaz could cover the demo team up onto the deck rails for an over-the-side drop into the water. Possible. But the Daria Yenur's freeboard was pretty fucking high. Even worse than the three-story drop, they would be vulnerable to a 180-degree assault while they tried to set up ropes. Movement to the left grabbed his attention. Sight. Trigger squeeze. Miss. He frowned as the terrorist scurried behind a crate and disappeared from view. Something slammed into his back. A sledgehammer that sent a tsunami of pain through his entire body. The pain in his spine was so acute, so electric, that it stole the breath from his lungs. He tried to move. Sparks of pain shot through his ass down his leg to his left foot. His big toe felt like it had exploded inside his boot. He tried to call out to Spaz, but he couldn't find his breath. He didn't need to. He heard Spaz's voice in his headset. Shooter on the bridge tower. Sniper up on the tower. Lead. Four. Are you okay? Are you hit? Kemper moved a hand to his radio and pressed the button to transmit on the wider frequency band to include command and control on his transmission. He opened his mouth, but all that came out was, Ugh. He tried to cough, tried to clear his throat, but he couldn't inhale enough air to push any out. It felt like a car had run over him, and now that same car was parked on his chest. He heard spaz again in his ear. One is hit. One is down. I'm going to get him. Four. Hold. Kemper wheezed. I'm okay. The electric shocks in his ass and leg were subsiding, but the pain dead center in his back was debilitating. He finally managed to suck in a deep breath, which radiated a new, heavier pain out along his ribs to both sides of his chest. He tried to move his legs and was punished with another lash of pain down the left leg, but his legs moved. His legs moved just fine. If I'd been shot through the spine, I'd be paralyzed. Despite the pain, Kemper couldn't help but grin. He'd almost left the ceramic plate out of his Kevlar vest when he was gearing up, hating how heavy and uncomfortable the damn thing was. But tonight, Prudence had persevered, and that damn sappy plate had stopped an AK-47 round from punching a hole through his spine. He counted to three, took a deep breath, and rolled to his right. Pain mushroomed across his back and down his leg as he dragged himself awkwardly toward the metal stairs leading down to the cargo deck. More sniper rounds rained down around him, exploding chunks of stair tread in his face as he belly crawled. He collapsed at the bottom of the stairs in a heap. Stealing himself, he crawled on his elbows around the staircase, moving outboard until he was behind the staircase and underneath the port deck rail. He pressed his back against the hull of the ship and exhaled with relief. In this position, he was shielded from above and out of the bridge sniper's line of fire. Four, he called to Spaz, loud enough to be heard even without the voice-activated mic. Dude, come to me. Knowing he needed to provide covering fire, Kemper reached up and grabbed a stair rung. Ignoring the pain that shot down his leg, he pulled himself to one knee and aimed blindly up at the catwalks that lined the bridge tower. He thumbed his M4 to a three-round burst and squeezed the trigger. He kept shooting, shifting his aim among different areas of the tower, until Spaz had ducked in beside him. With Spaz safe, he pulled back against the hull with a grunt. You hit, senior? 
Spaz asked, looking him over through his goggles. Took around in the back, he groaned. You mobile? Yeah, yeah, he said and waved a hand in annoyance. But I'm not sure where the fuck we're gonna go. A grenade exploded somewhere in the middle of the deck, showering everything in a fifteen-yard radius with wood fragments and pieces of burning tarp. That was one of our grenades, Kemper said. A second explosion followed, equally satisfying. That one, too, added Spaz. Paradise is going to get crowded with martyrs tonight. Amen, brother, Kemper said with a smirk. He thumbed the wider frequency button on his radio. Blackbeard, Maine, this is Blackbeard Actual. Blackbeard, Maine, Blackbeard Actual. While he waited for a reply, he watched Spaz take up a cover position. Blackbeard, this is Maine, go. Maine, Actual, heavy contact. Pinned down and need air support ASAP, over. There was a pause that seemed to last an eternity. Kemper could picture Commander Dietrich, the squadron skipper in the Tactical Operations Center, asking the SEAL air support coordinator for a time check and then swearing up a thunderstorm when he got the answer. Blackbeard, Maine. Little birds in five mics. Do you need hot exfil from the target or are you still a go for alpha? Kemper thought a moment. With the little birds hosing the bad guys, they could probably make the water for their plan A for exfil. But if they took casualties, then no way. And... If he was dicked up worse than he thought, could he make the swim? He thought of the fractured sappy plate, the trauma to his back, and said, Main, actual. Likely Alpha, but have Bravo in orbit and available. Copy, Dietrich said. Four mics. Switch to air. Kemper would switch to the air channel in a minute, but first he needed a sit rep from his team. Two, one, sit rep. Still at the package. Still heavy fire, but no casualties. Kemper nodded. Two hold positions, stay put. Six, one, you off the deck rails? Six, check. So everyone was clear of the raised deck and the demolition team was still hunkered down near the package. The Night Stalkers in their OH-58s were coming. With their miniguns, the helicopter pilots would hose down terrorist snipers on the bridge tower and then lay down suppressing fire, clearing a path from amidships to the stern. Kemper could direct them to use a rocket or two if needed, but that would be a last resort. Better to get off the ship and blow the package from a distance. Safer for all the good guys that way. Everyone hold. Little birds in three mics, let me know if you have to move. He switched his radio from the tactical channel to the air channel by feel. Stalker, 2-5, Blackbeard actual. Blackbeard, Stalker, go. Stalker, Blackbeard. Team in two elements, half of the package on the cargo deck amidships, half split between port and starboard below the deck rails. Taking sniper fire from the bridge tower and heavy contact from the aft cargo deck, everyone aft of our lights is a shithead. Copy, was all the little bird responded. It was enough. Kemper's team worked almost exclusively with the 160th. This was just another day at the office. Kemper gritted his teeth as he took a knee next to Spaz, pain flaring in his back and leg. He tapped Spaz on the shoulder. Relay to the team. I'll monitor air. Spaz nodded and then repeated the plan to the rest of the SEALs using his radio. A moment later, despite the din of automatic weapon fire on the cargo deck, Kemper's ears pricked to the familiar whine of the little helicopters. The sound was raspy and higher pitched than the stealth Blackhawks on which they had arrived. The need for stealth was past, and the call of firepower never sounded so sweet. Blackbeard, stalker, lights on, said the pilot's voice in Kemper's earpiece. Lights on. Kemper said to Spaz as he turned on his strobe. Spaz nodded, flipped on his own strobe, and relayed the order into his boom mic. A skinny guy holding an AK-47 popped his head around a crate less than twenty feet away. Without hesitation, Kemper fired two rounds. The first hit the crate, making the insurgent turn in Kemper's direction in surprise. The second round blew off the guy's lower jaw and half his face. The man dropped his rifle and fell twitching backward onto the deck. Kemper continued his sweep of the cargo deck and breathed a sigh of relief as other white strobes began to flash. The SEALs were switching on their helmet-mounted infrared strobes, an ID light visible only with night vision, and a safeguard against friendly fire. A heartbeat later, two OH-58s screamed across the deck of the ship at low altitude and then pulled up into a static hover. Clearing the bridge, Stalker reported in his headset. Copy. 
Tongues of flame spat from the helicopters as they showered the bridge, wings, and catwalks with fifty caliber fury. Tracers in the bullet streams created the illusion of long, fiery orange lassos licking the bridge tower. Entire sections of superstructure exploded, and chunks of metal crashed onto the raised deck. A moment later, a massive span of catwalk groaned and then broke free, tumbling in a roaring cascade of sparks, flame, and twisted metal. Kemper had seen it all before, but the destructive power of the tiny helicopters never ceased to amaze him. Clearing the deck for you, Blackbeard? Stalker reported in his headset. Kemper clicked his mic twice and then switched back to his team's tactical channel. Get ready to move, he called over the radio. Rally point Alpha, prepare for exfil. He shifted into a crouch and sighted over his rifle. He followed the bouncing red dot through his NVGs, looking for terrorist shooters trying to flee the maze of crates. No visible targets. He wasn't surprised, considering the strafing in progress. The OH-58 pilots were using night vision, which meant they could see the SEAL strobes, but they also had their thermals up to spot the heat signatures of any shitheads still hiding under the tarps. Kemper squinted as the two little birds swung around and began to light up the cargo deck. Hopefully, Thiel had correctly identified the package, and the remaining crates being obliterated weren't loaded with sarin. Tracer flares, muzzle blasts, and spot fires turned night into day, and Kemper had to look away to preserve his night eyes. Staring down at his feet, he waited, listening to the sound of wooden crates exploding like geysers, raining fiery chunks of debris across the cargo deck. And then, as abruptly as it had begun, the firestorm was over. Kemper got to his feet and assumed a tactical crouch. He raised his rifle and signaled to Spaz to move aft. The first heavy step of his boot unleashed an explosion of pain in the middle of his back and a fresh bolt of lightning down his left leg. Two more strides and his foot felt blown up inside his boot. He paused for a moment and the pain waned, leaving only a throbbing ache in his pelvis and thigh. Dread washed over him as the severity of his injury finally began to register. Bullet broke my fucking back. One bad step. One wrong movement and the fractured vertebrae could slip, shift, or collapse and cut his spinal cord in half. What the hell was he supposed to do then? We gotta keep moving, senior, Spaz whispered. I know, he grumbled and took another step. Spaz fanned out to the left while he stayed right. He swiveled back and forth in a thirty-degree arc, scanning the path ahead for enemy shooters moving up from the stern. Each turn of his torso brought another red-hot saber stabbing him in the back. He tried to swallow the pain and push forward, but he was beginning to falter. He was falling behind. Movement, port side, aft of last row of pallets. Stalker warned in his earpiece. You're too close for me to engage. Kemper swung left and scanned the inboard deck. He spied the row of pallets, but no movement. He surged forward as Spaz widened his sweep. Kemper's IR dot danced with shadows green and gray, but he found no enemies to engage. He held his crouch and moved another three steps. Then, in his peripheral vision, something flashed white. The guttural pop of an AK-47 followed a split second later. He swept the deck and spotted a prone figure holding a rifle. Kemper trained his targeting dot onto the man's forehead and fired twice. The impact flipped the terrorist onto his back where he stared up at the night sky, one eye remaining in half a head. Shit! I think I'm hit! Spaz called out. Kemper spun to his right and found Spaz sitting on the deck, his rifle in his lap. He took two giant strides to close the gap, adrenaline masking his pain. He knelt beside Spaz. You okay, bro? He asked, quickly scanning an arc around their position for other shooters. You tell me, Spaz said, looking down at his leg, bewildered. In the monochrome green of night vision... Kemper saw a black stain spreading on Spaz's gray utility pants. Not good. The wound was located on the thigh just below the drop holster straps for the kid's Sig Sauer P226 9mm pistol. Kemper reached down with a gloved hand and pressed. His pressure was met with a nauseating crunch and an equally nauseating moan from Spaz. Your fucking femur's broken, Kemper said. Awesome! Spaz coughed through gritted teeth. Got a man down, Kemper said into his mic. I can get him to the fan tail, but I need some cover. Two clicks told him his message was received. Whether he could actually deliver on his promise was a coin flip. 
His back was completely fucked, but he was a goddamn seal, and seals do whatever it takes for their brothers. Whatever it takes. He helped Spaz recline until he was lying on the deck, then Kemper positioned the nape of his own neck and plateau of his shoulders across Spaz's midsection. He wrapped Spaz's left arm and bleeding left leg around him, like putting on a sweater. Then he twisted and rolled Spaz on top of him. He struggled to his feet under the crushing weight of his fully loaded teammate. Staying in a crouch, he crossed Spaz's arm and leg together in front of his chest and held them in place with his left hand, freeing up his right to bring his rifle to bear. He scanned the deck, saw no one, and moved forward. The first step stole his breath, leaving just enough air for an anguished howl. On the second step, his left leg turned to a bag of dead meat. He crumpled to his knees, the explosion of pain in his back dangerously close to making him pass out. Fuck, he grunted as he tried to push himself back onto his feet, using his rifle as a cane. Put me down, Spaz whispered, his voice ripe with agony. No. Kemper staggered forward, leaning heavily on his right leg and supporting his left with his rifle cane. Less than fifteen yards to go. He could already see two of his fellow seals adjusting ropes on the stern deck ahead of him. Put me down, senior. I can walk. Not with a shattered femur. You can't, he huffed. We're almost there. Automatic weapon fire echoed behind him, but Kemper couldn't turn, much less return fire. He pressed forward, depending on the other operators to kill the threat. If they didn't, at least his world of pain would end. Fifteen feet. Ten. Seven. Five. He collapsed at the feet of two seals, providing cover fire for them at the railing. Tears clouded his vision. He felt someone lift Spaz off his broken back. Unencumbered, he tried to press up onto his hands and knees, but his left leg was dead. You first, senior. No arguing, said the closer seal. It was Roush, their 18 Delta combat medic who was now in command since this had just become a Cassivac instead of an exfil. I'll send Pablo down next, then Spaz, okay? Roush added. Okay, Kemper said through gritted teeth. Spaz took one to the right femur. He's bleeding out. You carried his ass, senior, but it's my job to fix him. Now go. Thiel and Pablo got Kemper to his feet while Roush attended to Spaz. Thiel helped him hook a figure-eight descender device onto the repelling rope, and Pablo clipped it into a carabiner in the center of his kit. Thiel lifted Kemper's left leg over the railing for him and handed it to him like a piece of luggage. I want to take that with you, Thiel said, the corners of his mouth curling up. Kemper grunted, leaned back, and pushed off the hull of the Daria Ye fucking Noor. Repelling down the side of the ship, he could manage. Thinning away with his broken back and useless left leg. That was going to be a bitch. His gaze on Thiel's furrowed brow and his thoughts on Spaz. Kemper descended into the black. Chapter 2 200 feet over the desert floor. Russian MI-17 helicopter, Western Al-Anbar Province, Iraq. October 13th, 0145 local time. Something warm and wet dripped onto the nape of Dempsey's neck. Scowling, he reached back and used his collar to soak up the offending liquid. He glanced up at a run of hydraulic lines snaking along the ceiling of the helicopter's cargo compartment. Another drip splattered on his bottom lip. The seal, sitting next to him, chuckled. The pilot says if this bird stops leaking oil, they'll let him know immediately. Chunk grinned at Dempsey in the green-gray world of night vision. "'Why's that?' Dempsey asked, wiping the sweet, slimy fluid from his lips. "'Cause it means this pig's out of oil and we're going to fucking crash.' Dempsey rolled his eyes behind his NVGs. "'You sure this piece of shit is flight-worthy?' "'It's a coin toss,' Chunk said, packing his lower lip with snuff. "'She ain't no sixty. That's for damn sure.' Dempsey snorted. He harbored a deep loathing for old Russian helicopters. This bird couldn't hang with a fleet Seahawk, much less the slick, modified MH-60M Blackhawks the 160th usually sported around in. He missed the 60s wide-open cargo doors. He liked hanging his legs out the side during infill. 
rear, port side, every time. He was about to say so to Chunk when an unexpected wave of nostalgia soured his mood. Snapshot images of his Tier 1 brothers murdered in Yemen swirled in his mind, taunting him with memories of happier times. He took a deep breath and looked out the tiny plexiglass porthole at the Wild West below. What the hell am I doing here? He mumbled, suddenly feeling out of sorts. The tightness of his gear, the weight of the assault rifle slung across his chest, the whir of the helicopter rotors as they whisked across the desert at night, all these familiar sensations that should be a comfort to him were suddenly having the opposite effect. It's only deja vu he told himself, but it felt different from that. This was dark déjà vu, if there was such a thing. He looked around the cargo compartment, expecting to find Romeo, or perhaps Romeo's ghost, but he didn't recognize a single face. This team was loose, confident, and so very young. They were a tight brotherhood, but not his brotherhood. You should not be here, John Dempsey. Fate whispered in his ear. But you can't help yourself. You want to dance with me again? Take my hand. Take my hand. Take it. Want a pinch? Chunk said, waving a tin of wintergreen skull in front of Dempsey's face. Looks like he could use one. Dempsey ran his tongue along the inside of his lower lip. The offer was tempting. Nah, I'm good, he said. But thanks, bro. He felt a lumbering heaviness as the pilot flared the Russian helo on approach. They were putting out much farther from the target than what would have been necessary for the ultra-quiet stealth hawks of his past, but tonight's air taxi was taking advantage of an entirely different type of stealth. To anyone on the ground, this Soviet-era bird was indistinguishable from those used by the Iraqi government's dated air force. The hope was that this sortie would be seen as another ineffective Iraqi government patrol rather than an American special warfare infill. As Smith had said to him two days ago, It's all about keeping a low profile. The folks at home may not know we have American boots on the ground in the battle against ISIS, but the ISIS fighters sure as hell do. Chunk gave the signal to make ready, and the SEALs shifted into position. It took two operators to open the bulky, rusted, ridiculously narrow door on the port side of the helicopter. Dempsey watched as they kicked out a single bag of heavy rope. Compared to dual rope drops, which were standard operating procedure on Blackhawks, this single rope drop would add precious seconds to their infill. Another reason to hate this goddamn helicopter. Dempsey patiently waited his turn as the pilot hovered. Finally, he was on the rope, dropping toward the desert floor followed a heartbeat later by Chunk. Engulfed in dusty rotor wash, he hit the dirt, cleared to the left, and dropped prone. In unison with the other SEALs, Dempsey scanned his designated sector for threats. Chunk let the dust clear and the noise fade before finally raising a hand. Then, Custer 1, eight SEALs and Dempsey, started their fast march through the desert. Custer 2, the other half of the assault force, was being delivered by a different helo to the north. With perfect synchronicity, they would arrive at the target at the same time. The team fanned out behind the point man, who periodically glanced at the pre-programmed GPS on his left wrist and made subtle corrections to their course as they hoofed it through the barren Iraqi wasteland. Clusters of trees and grasses began to appear as they closed in on the Euphrates River. Dempsey surveyed the terrain carefully analyzing each outcropping for cover should they encounter an ISIS patrol before reaching the target. Five minutes later, white lights began to bleed onto the dull, monochrome horizon. Civilization, he thought, if there was such a thing left in Iraq. On seeing the lights, the point man altered course to the west. Ten minutes later, they were at the rally point, crouching in a cluster of tall, lush grass along the bank of a small tributary. From their cover, Dempsey surveyed the target compound. Unlike the hundreds of crumbling stucco shitholes he had hit during missions in Iraq, this compound was swank. Even through his NVGs, the house looked like it could have been plucked from Mansion Row on Bayshore Boulevard in Tampa and airdropped to the bank of the Euphrates. 
Looking through the iron gate of the perimeter security wall, he could see several dusty SUVs and one stretch sedan parked on the circular brick paver driveway. Beyond the vehicles, a grand curved stairwell led to a main entrance adorned with ornate glass double doors. Eyes, Chunk said. Dempsey turned his head and watched the operator beside the lieutenant pull a laptop from his kit pocket and open an umbrella-style antenna. Then the SEAL checked a separate PDA to locate the particular satellite he meant to link with. After orienting the antenna, he gave Chunk a thumbs up. Coming up now, linking to the Predator. Chunk leaned onto his side to better see the screen. Fucking sweet, he said in a low voice. Gotta love these cloudless Iraqi nights, much better than in the stand. Dempsey craned his neck to see over Chunk's shoulder. The feed from the Predator circling 20,000 feet overhead was perfect. The drone's high-resolution zoom put their POV a couple hundred feet above the compound. Dempsey counted a half-dozen black silhouettes patrolling the walled perimeter. The seal with the laptop tapped an icon, and the image switched to the infrared band. The house transformed from gray to a pale yellow, and the bodies morphed into multi-hued blobs. Dempsey began counting the orange-red silhouettes inside the house. With multi-level structures, it was difficult to determine which people occupied which floor, but he'd learned some perspective tricks over the years. He counted six men on the upper level and a dozen-plus on the ground floor. Most of the figures were moving about, but a cluster of seven men were stationary, undoubtedly seated, in a large room in the left rear corner of the house. An orange figure walked into the room and then, in sequential order, paused next to each stationary figure. A junior shithead serving that thick, sweet-ass tea they loved to his masters, Dempsey decided. Chunk gave Dempsey a nudge. A count nineteen in the house and six in the yard. Is that about what you were expecting? Uh, actually, I was expecting our guy to travel with a bigger contingent. Dempsey whispered, feeling very much the misinformed spook. You said your intel weenie is right 95% of the time? That's right. Chunk spit a glob of tobacco juice into the weeds. Let's hope we're not the 5%, bro. Amen, Dempsey said while secretly praying that Baldwin and the boys back in Virginia hadn't let him down. Chunk checked his watch and then turned to the operator with the laptop. Get the air inbound and have them call five mics. The SEAL gave him a thumbs up and began tapping commands into his laptop. Custer Actual 2, this is Custer 1, 10 mics is briefed. Dempsey nodded to himself as he heard the Roger from the head shed back in Earbill and a double click from Custer 2 over the radio. Chunk had not announced any changes to the plan, which meant the mission would execute as briefed. Both assault teams would breach and hit simultaneously. Once they had secured the compound perimeter, the teams would enter the house and start sweeping. At that point, when the element of surprise was no longer a concern, the little birds would arrive on station to provide aerial fire support. In tandem, a reserve team of eight more SEALs would arrive with two Blackhawks from the 160th. The reserve team, at Dempsey's suggestion, was tasked with rounding up squirters and providing backup fire support if needed. Once the sweep was complete, the two Blackhawks would be standing by to exfil most of the SEALs and transport any crows off the target for interrogation. The time dragged, as it always did in the hold, and Dempsey occupied himself by scanning for targets outside the perimeter wall. As his internal clock ticked down toward zero, he redirected his focus inside the courtyard, scanning the stairs leading to the front entrance. Just about the time he felt his muscles tense in anticipation of the go, Chunk's voice crackled over the wireless circuit. Custer, positions. The young SEAL officer raised a hand and the rest of the team appeared in unison, materializing silently from their hiding places in the grass. Dempsey surveyed the wide gap between the cover of the reeds and the wall surrounding the compound. A surge of adrenaline amped his systems to peak levels in preparation for the silent sprint from safety to the wall. They crossed the gap low and fast. Chunk held them huddled against the wall a moment, listened for any indication they had been spotted. Satisfied his team was still in the dark, he gave a hand signal, fanning them out while a designated seal packed a breacher charge into a crack in the mortar. 
Custer 2, 1. Set. Chunk called over the wireless. Set. The answer came back from the team leader on the north side of the compound. Chunk glanced at his watch. Stalker 2-5 position. Three mics out. The OH-6 helicopter pilot called back. Sixties, two minutes in tail. Chunk caught Dempsey's eye. Dempsey nodded his agreement. It was time. The lieutenant flashed him a cocky grin and gave the order to detonate the breacher charge. There was a whump from the explosion and the echo of another from the far side of the compound. Dust and the acrid smells of chemical explosive filled Dempsey's nose and mouth. The sweet, familiar taste of assault. He popped into a combat crouch and followed Chunk through the hole in the wall. The remaining seals fell in behind him. The seals fanned out in both directions from the hole, just in time to avoid the blind fire from the terrorist guards at the locus of the explosion. Dempsey picked his first target, an armed ISIS soldier descending the main stairs from the entry. He squeezed off a round from his Sig Sauer and watched the figure crumple down the steps. He shifted the green targeting dot to a new target, the head of a second terrorist fleeing back into the house. Dempsey's bullet struck the jihadist in the back of the head. A black cloud erupted in the air, painted in high-contrast monochrome. The staccato pops of Sapmod M4 fire were now drowning out the deeper bark of the ISIS fighters' AK-47s, signaling to Dempsey that the battle for the perimeter was almost over. He swept his rifle right across the yard, scanning for targets, but found none left standing. The exterior was won. The battle to claim the house would be much more dangerous. Chunk signaled for the team to advance on the entry. Dempsey had not taken more than two strides when the ground around him lit up with tracers as an ISIS fighter fired on them from the roof. At the same time, he heard the whine of the little birds screaming in low overhead. Custer, this is Talker 2-5. Strobe's on and we'll clear the roof for you. Dempsey reached up and clicked on the IR strobe on his helmet in unison with the other seals. The flashing lights would be visible only in night vision, which he prayed the bad guys didn't have. He looked up and saw an OH-6 gunship banking sharply into position. A second later, there was a loud belch and a tongue of fire licked out from the side of the little helo. Dempsey ducked his head as chunks of pulverized stucco and roofing material rained down on his helmet and shoulders. Roof clear came the calm, unflappable voice of the Army Special Forces pilot. Dempsey flinched with anticipation. He had to fight the powerful urge to lead the team in. Beneath the fading whine of the little bird bugging out, he detected the growl of approaching Blackhawks. The timing was perfect. Sixties inbound meant the reserve force had arrived to secure the perimeter while they mopped up inside. A heartbeat later, Chunk was on the move. Dempsey followed him and two other SEALs up the left side of the curved stone staircase, while three operators advanced up the right side with near-perfect symmetry. The double-entry doors were wide open, their decorative frosted window panels now shattered wrecks. Glass crunched underfoot as Dempsey crossed the threshold and stepped into the cavernous foyer. A cathedral ceiling towered overhead, and a spiral staircase to their right arced up to the second story. At movement along the railing, Dempsey sighted and fired. The jihadist crumpled into a heap and rolled halfway down the stairs, his AK-47 clattering the rest of the way down. "'Thought she wanted your guy alive,' Chunk said, the corners of his mouth turned up in a sarcastic grin. "'That ain't him,' Dempsey grumbled. The seals drifted into a half-circle in the foyer, their rifles up and scanning. A beat later, more seals, led by Custer II, entered through the front to join them. By special warfare standards, this was an insanely large force to take a lone terrorist compound. But Dempsey was happy to err on the side of overwhelming firepower tonight. He had underestimated the enemy twice before, and both times it had cost him dearly. He would not make that mistake again. Never again. Chunk signaled for the new arrivals to ascend the stairs and for his team to hold. Those who remained below covered the balcony in the doorway leading out of the foyer into the main house. Once the ascending operators controlled the landing, Chunk tapped Dempsey's shoulder and gestured that he intended to advance. Dempsey nodded and followed him deeper into the house. They cleared the doorway, only to find themselves in a transverse hallway, forcing Chunk to split the team yet again. Dempsey and three others followed Chunk right, and three other seals went left. The next room they entered was a great room littered with upended furniture. 
ISIS fighters had taken defensive positions behind sofas and chairs, intent on making their last stand. It didn't matter. Chunk and Dempsey were too fast, too seasoned, too accurate. In five seconds it was done. Four enemy shooters laid out with headshots. For the next half minute, Dempsey heard sporadic bursts of fire echoing about the house, but almost all from American M4s and MP7s. Back room, northwest corner, came the call over Dempsey's headset. Think we got him. Chunk raised his eyebrows at the news and motioned Dempsey to follow him back in the direction the other three SEALs had gone. They entered the room just as a SEAL was tightening zip ties around the wrists of a kneeling fighter. A second man sat at the head of the table, flanked by two SEALs pointing their rifles at the back of his head. Three other ISIS fighters lay motionless in expanding pools of blood. A family portrait hung crooked on the facing wall. Once upon a time, this was someone's dining room, before the ISIS usurpers turned it into their private war room. A burst of gunfire reverberated directly overhead, followed immediately by a calm report over the comms channel. One, two, upstairs is secure, eight KIA and two crows. Copy two, Chunk replied into his mic. Dempsey studied the man still sitting at the expansive dining table. Presumably, this was Rafiq al-Mahajer. The warlord's thick black beard was wet with chai, and there was a large brown stain on the front of his gray man-dress, as Romeo used to call them. The sudden memory of Romeo was painful, but he swallowed it down. No distractions. He chastised himself. You've been waiting for this moment for years. You made me bring twenty-two operators for this piece of shit, Chunk said, sneering at the terrorist. I hope he's worth it. Dempsey mentally compared the jihadist's features to the photographs he had studied of Rafiq al-Mahajer, but he already knew. Nose too narrow, eyes too closely set, beard not gray enough, and something else. This man is not an Arab. Damn it. It's not him, Dempsey said through clenched teeth. What? Chunk said, incredulous. He pulled a PDA from his kit, tapped it to open a picture of Al-Mahajer, and held the screen out beside the man's face. The terrorist stared back at them with dark, angry eyes. Dempsey saw abject hatred in those eyes, but none of the fear he remembered in the Mujahideen he'd captured before. This man would gladly die for Allah. Fuck, you're right, it's not him, Chunk said, and snapped a picture of the warlord with his PDA. He handed the device to the operator beside him, the same SEAL who had set up the laptop with satellite comms outside. Here, Gyro, find out who this asshole is, he said, then turning to Dempsey. You know this guy? Is he on any of your lists? Dempsey shook his head. While the other SEAL ran a facial recognition search on the terrorist, he let his mind race furiously. Had they hit too early? Could Rafiq have been en route from Kaim but running late? Did he know about the attack in advance, or had Rafiq escaped yet again? Dempsey pulled on Chunk's sleeve and leaned in close. Task the Predator to sweep a two-mile perimeter for squirters, then check the roads between here and Kaim. Look for a convoy on its way here, or worse, hauling ass back west. Check, Chunk said, and looked with disgust at the bearded man at the end of the table. He pulled his comms operator aside to pass the instructions in a whisper. Dempsey walked over to the terrorist who was sitting with his back so straight and upright it looked like it hurt. The man stared at him with smoldering hatred. Dempsey clucked his tongue against the back of his teeth. It's a shame, LT, he said, circling around behind the prisoner. A shame we didn't have more survivors we could bring back for questioning. Chunk gave him a quizzical look. Yeah, I suppose. Got any skull? Dempsey asked, looking past the prisoner and smiling. Sure, Chunk said and tossed him the can, his face even more confused. Dempsey packed a generous pinch of snuff behind his lower lip, then wiped his tobacco-coated fingers on the jihadist's sleeve. The prisoner visibly tensed at the touch. He tossed the can back to Chunk, slid out the chair beside the man, and took a seat. 
Then he spit a thick gob of brown tobacco juice onto the terrorist's sandaled foot. The man jerked his foot away, disgusted. Merhaba, Dempsey said and leaned forward. Shismek? he asked, inquiring as to the man's name. The terrorist made a show of turning away and staring at the far wall. Draftachi in inglesi, he continued. Do you speak English? The ISIS fighter glanced at him and then immediately looked away. Dempsey leaned back in his chair. Yeah, you speak English, you fuck, he said and laughed. Win Rafik al Mahajer. The man said nothing. Dempsey could feel Chunk's eyes on him now. Time to escalate things a bit. He leaned forward, trying for eye contact, but the prisoner kept his gaze forward and distant. Then, without a word, Dempsey grabbed the man's beard and yanked, smashing his face against the wooden tabletop, and then pushed him back upright in the chair. A small laceration opened on the bridge of the man's nose, and blood began to run down the left cheek until it disappeared in his heavy, dark beard. The jihadist glanced at Dempsey for only an instant, but long enough for Dempsey to see something new in the man's eyes. Fear, and fear, told Dempsey volumes. This crow knew Rafik al-Mahajer. Lieutenant, give me your knife, Dempsey said softly. He saw the man's eyes flick to the bowie strapped to the front of Chunk's kit. For what? Chunk asked his tone insinuating that he was not cool with where Dempsey's impromptu interrogation was heading. I'm going to cut off this guy's thumbs. Maybe that will help jog his memory about where his boss is. As he said it, he watched the man tuck his thumbs inside balled-up fists. Dempsey resisted the urge to smile. He had no intention of cutting anyone's thumbs off, but this shithead didn't know that. Knife, any grunt might understand, but thumbs... This guy was definitely fluent in English, and that would save time, since Dempsey's Arabic was rusty at best. Why don't you guys take the other crow downstairs while we chat with our friend here? Chunk said to the three other seals in the room. He gestured at the kneeling ISIS fighter, whose hands were bound behind his back, and then nodded at the doorway. Roger that, said the closest seal. Chunk clearly didn't want his team to have any part of what he feared was about to happen. Dempsey respected the lieutenant for that, but tonight he was OGA. Tonight he was playing a game with a different rule book. He needed the prisoner to believe torture was in bounds, and he saw no way to achieve that without roping Chunk into the ruse. We'll be right down, Chunk called after the junior seals, shuffling the other terrorist out the door. He pulled Dempsey aside. This cannot happen here, he said quietly but firmly. This is my mission, and there's no way I'll have my team connected with CIA torture bullshit. Dempsey met the lieutenant's gaze. Then you should go downstairs and join your guys. Without offering a chance for rebuttal, he turned his back on the seal and strode toward the seated jihadist. In a single, fluid motion, he drew his own knife, arced the blade high over his head, and drove the point down toward the prisoner's hand. Where is Rafik al-Mahajer? He screamed as the knife slammed in the table with a resounding thud. Nein, please, no! The bearded man screamed. After a beat, the jihadist opened his eyes and looked down to survey the damage. Dempsey watched him slump with relief. The knife was embedded an inch deep in the table and a scant millimeter from the tips of his knuckles. Dempsey pulled the knife out of the table, but he did not return it to its scabbard. So you do speak English, he said, spinning the knife hilt in his palm. And German. Chunk shot him a quizzical look. This guy's German, Dempsey said, answering the unspoken question. You gotta check the other database to find him. The jihadist looked pale. You are CIA? He said in a trembling voice. You wish, Dempsey said with a laugh. They got protocols for situations like this oversight and ethical guidelines, shit like that designed to protect assholes like you. No, I'm just a contractor. They hire me to take out the trash. He slapped the side of the man's bearded face. The door opened and the comms operator stuck his head in. For an instant, 
Dempsey could have sworn he looked disappointed to see the jihadist still sitting upright and lucid. Hey, LT, he said. Chunk walked over to him and the seal whispered something in his ear. Chunk slapped him on the shoulder and he left, conspicuously closing the door behind him. Chunk walked over to Dempsey. There's nothing going on between here and Kaim, he whispered. They're tracking a couple of pickup trucks, but they look like patrols. Squirters on foot? Chunk shook his head. Dempsey frowned. Burned again. He didn't get it. The intel was solid. Baldwin didn't make mistakes, even with other people's data. If Rafiq al-Mahajer decided not to show, then it meant he'd sent this guy as a proxy. Dempsey shifted his attention to two confiscated laptops and a Blackberry on the table beside the prisoner. If, on a scale of 1 to 10, Rafiq rated a 7, then his proxy was a 5, which meant that this mission was not a failure. Proxies had value, and more importantly, so did the electronics they carried. Dempsey probed a pocket for his sat phone. He needed to check with Smith, but he was 99% certain Jarvis would want one of their people to take a turn with this guy. That meant escorting the prisoner to Baghdad, where hopefully Smith and Jarvis could make arrangements with the CIA to transport the crow out of Iraq. Suddenly the thought of flying in the Russian helo turned Dempsey's stomach. Maybe if he was real nice to Chunk, he'd be able to hitch a ride in one of the Blackhawks that had delivered the reserve force. What now? Chunk asked, interrupting Dempsey's mental masturbation about which helo he would be riding in. I have a ride waiting to take my new friend somewhere very special, Dempsey said, glancing at the prisoner. The bearded fighter's cheeks were still pale, but his eyes were regaining the fire Dempsey had seen before. Dempsey smiled and spun the knife in his hand one last time before shoving the blade back into its scabbard. I know what you're thinking, tough guy but you might as well put that idea to bed right now. Everyone talks eventually, he said. Everyone. Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of War Shadows by Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson. Performed by Ray Porter. For our parents, thank you for instilling in us the courage and wisdom to discern the difference between what is right and what is easy, and for supporting us when our journeys took us in harm's way. And for all of you out there, still serving at the pointy end of the spear, you know who you are. Safe travels and good hunting. OGA, acronym for Other Government Agency denoting clandestine operations conducted independent of the military chain of command. In most cases, OGA refers to units administered, funded, and controlled by the Central Intelligence Agency, but not all OGA personnel fall under the CIA umbrella. OGA assets conduct counterterrorism operations, intelligence collection, and communication efforts with deep cover assets embedded within enemy organizations. Their existence is categorically denied. Prologue Camp al Qaim, formerly FOB Tiger, 310 kilometers west of the secret Tier 1 SEAL Team compound. al Qaim, Iraq, 2300 local time, 2006. The desert is no place for a SEAL, Jack Kemper told himself, but to the desert they sent him again and again and again. He'd logged more than 800 days in theater over the past four years, and this deployment looked to be the worst yet, kicking off with 28 missions in 30 days. Kemper was raw. Raw from the heat, raw from the killing, but most of all, raw from the moon dust that covered everything in the far western corner of Iraq. The Wild West, they called it. It was a terrible place, this place. Far from the sea, far from his family, and far from God. This was no place for a Navy SEAL. It was no place for a human being. He shifted his Sopmod M4 on his chest and subconsciously tightened his fingers on the grip. The situation could be worse, he told himself, 
He could be alone. He could be unarmed. He could be a goddamn spook flying around in some piece of shit Russian KA-27 helicopter. The CIA was fond of repurposing old Russian helos so as not to attract attention, shuttling their war shadows around the red zones. The day Kemper found himself riding around in a camov like a spook would be the day he asked Thiel to put a bullet in his brain. He looked around at the seven other Tier 1 operators who, like him, were waiting for the go. What the hell are you grinning at? asked Aaron Thiel, Kemper's best friend since SEAL qualification training. Chafing, Kemper answered, kicking up a cloud of dust with his heel. Fucking moon dust is rubbing me raw in all the wrong kind of places. There's nothing funny about chafing, dude. Thiel shook his head. I got moon dust in my eyes, in my nose. Hell, I even got moon dust coming out my ass. I feel like I swallow a pound of this shit every day. Kemper swiped his tongue along the outside of his front teeth, clearing the grit off what should have been smooth enamel. His mouth was so dry he couldn't muster the saliva to spit it out. He swallowed instead. What the fuck is taking so long? The head shed is killing me. Romeo, sitting next to Kemper, was the greenest seal on the squad and had earned a reputation for being high maintenance. Despite these shortcomings, the kid had proved himself to be one hell of a shooter under pressure. Besides, being the greenest seal in a Tier 1 unit was nothing to cry over, sort of like being the shortest first-round draft pick of the NBA. It ain't the head shed, bro, Kemper replied. Captain Jarvis wouldn't tolerate Perry dicking around like this. It's those spooks that came in twenty minutes ago. They're the logjam holding us up. Goddamn spooks, why can't they just make up their minds? Let's screw this cat already. Kemper laughed. He had no idea where the cat expression came from. Somewhere in Romeo's twisted mind, but he shared the anxious feeling. During SQT and BUDS, they had been conditioned for every conceivable form of abuse and punishment, both mental and physical, except for one. The waiting. There was the waiting in the barracks, waiting in the Black Hawk, waiting in the mini-sub, waiting in the water, waiting in the brush, waiting in the dirt, waiting in the dark, always and every day, the waiting. Kemper slapped Romeo on the back. Don't worry, Romeo, Jarvis will get this train back on track. Romeo didn't bother answering. Instead, he spat a brown squirt of tobacco juice from angry, pursed lips. Kemper shifted his foot to avoid the gob of skull splattering over his oakley boot. The sound of a door swinging open and then slamming shut made Kemper look up. Senior Chief Perry strode out of the Tactical Operations Center, accompanied by some dude wearing civilian cargo pants and a green Timberland shirt. The stranger carried an assault rifle across his chest, wore a drop holster on his left thigh, and had the look. Definitely a spook, Kemper thought, studying the man. The spook's rifle was slung properly, so maybe this jackass knew what he was doing. The NCO and the spook approached the cluster of wooden picnic tables where Kemper and the rest of the boys had been waiting, fully kitted up and ready to go, for the past forty minutes. This is Jones, Perry said to the team, his Alabama twang extra thick tonight. Kemper glanced across the picnic table at Thiel, who rolled his eyes. Spooks were all either Jones or Smith, it seemed. Jones will be joining us on the up, Perry continued. Tonight's high-value target is of special interest to our spooky friends, and the consensus is that Jones needs to be there when we hit the X. Awesome, Kemper snorted under his breath. Nothing changes from what we briefed. Two teams of four. Only difference is that Jones will be riding fifth wheel. Not it. Romeo interrupted with a grin. This plan was vetted by Captain Jarvis to so keep your shit to yourself, Romeo. Perry barked. Romeo looked at his feet. As I was saying, Jones will be riding fifth wheel with me, Kemper, Sanders, and... The NCO paused, savoring the moment with a smile. Romeo. Romeo looked up, flashed his own cocky smile back, and barked. Who ya, senior? Perry let it slide. Glancing at his watch, he said, No other changes. We're still on our timeline. Matt is set up here, and Kaim will also be our FARP. 
The Kazovac bird is staged here as well, along with the PJs as briefed. Any questions? Behind him, Kemper could hear the slow, rising whine of the engines on the two Black Hawk helicopters from the Army's elite 160th SOAR unit. Yeah, I have a question, Kemper said, looking at Jones. Is there anything else we need to know? The spook held his stare, and Kemper saw something in the man's eyes. Arrogance? No, nothing so petty. Jones was a man with purpose. He was also a man who had carnal knowledge of the enemy. But Kemper knew that sometimes that knowledge could be a double-edged sword in the field. Nothing relevant that wasn't already in your mission brief, the spook said. Kemper smirked. Yep, he hated these spook motherfuckers. Stingy with their intel and always changing the rules of the game at the last minute. This spook seemed more legit than most, but if Jones had read his Excel spreadsheet wrong, it would be Kemper and his Tier 1 brothers at the tip of the spear who would pay the ultimate price. All right, fellas, said Perry. Roll tide. By the time the boys piled into the back of the Black Hawk, Rotor Wash had moon dust flying everywhere. Squinting, Kemper clicked his night vision goggles down into place, transforming the desert into an eerie gray-green moonscape. He scooted to the rearmost edge of the port side door, hooked in and let his feet dangle over the skid. As the helo took flight, he watched the forward operating base shrink below. Camp al Qaim was unimpressive, a desolate shithole a stone's throw from the border of Syria. Despite the heavy U.S. military presence in Iraq, the border was a porous entry point for weapons and fighters, supporting al-Qaeda's growing presence post-Saddam. And, despite the Joint Special Operations Command's best efforts, the situation wasn't improving. Nine months ago, while Kemper was stateside between deployments, a brutal, coordinated al-Qaeda offensive had targeted Camp al Qaim. Nine Americans had died, and dozens more were wounded defending the base, but ultimately the terrorist attack had been thwarted. The casualties in the jihadist ranks had been higher than those reported by the Western press, but that seemed to be the media's modus operandi these days, skew and twist, massage and dismiss. It didn't matter. Kemper's clearance level meant he always learned the whole truth. When he told Kate that he'd lost two buddies in the firefight, she went ballistic. Even the most dedicated Navy wives had their breaking points. She told him she wanted him out of the Navy, and he understood why. She might as well be a single mom, she cried. Jacob was growing up without a dad. It was time to retire the trident and become the husband and father he'd taken a vow to be. He'd paid his dues, given his pound of flesh to the war on terror. It was time to let someone else carry the load. Tier 1 would survive without him. For the unit, you're replaceable, Kate had cried. But for us, you're not. Her words that night had battered down his defenses, and he'd promised her he would retire from the unit the next day. But when the next day came, he broke that promise. And now here he was, back in the suck. The nose of the helicopter dropped and the green flight line beneath him disappeared as they sped low over the desert floor. Their infill point was a short hop, only thirteen minutes away. Tonight's hop was a carbon copy of the twenty-eight before it, snatching al-Qaeda leadership and mujahideen pussies out of their compounds scattered in the barren desert. Their ultimate objective, according to Captain Jarvis, was cutting the head off the snake. But with each passing day and each hollow victory, Kemper sensed Jarvis's metaphor was fundamentally flawed. Al-Qaeda wasn't a snake. It was a hydra. Chop off one head and two more vipers sprouted to take its place. Somewhere in this godforsaken desert there was a wellspring yielding a seemingly inexhaustible supply of young Muslim men willing to martyr themselves in the name of jihad against the West. As troublesome as the mid-level jihadists were, the teams harbored greater disdain for the Mujahideen. The Muj proclaimed themselves leaders, but they never dirtied their hands. Instead, these men used children to fight their war for them. They recruited orphans and kidnapped others to fuel their cub camps, where they brainwashed kids into becoming remorseless gunmen and suicide bombers before reaching age ten. 
It was the Mudge who had incited the growing insurgency against American forces in Iraq, and it was the Mudge currently stoking the flames of rebellion inside Syria. In Kemper's opinion, the Mujahideen Council was evolving into a terrorism bureaucracy umbrella, making al-Qaeda far more dangerous than before, which was probably why grabbing high-value Mudge targets had become a top priority for the Pentagon, which in turn explained why the JSOC was running Kemper and his team ragged. Finding and extracting Mujahideen scattered across the Wild West was both difficult and dangerous, even for operators as elite as Kemper and his Tier 1 brothers. They'd had several close calls recently, and they'd found the enemy becoming more tactically competent and evasive as the mission count climbed. On the bright side, after they killed the gunmen and suicide bombers protecting a Muj, the terrorists' boldness always evaporated. Rather than risk personal injury, the pussies always surrendered. That's why the team had to keep going, night after night after night, extract intel, find the connections to other known bad guys, and dismantle the next terror attack before it could materialize. What's wrong with me? Kemper thought, shaking his head. I'm thinking like a spook. He looked up the line at where Jones was sitting, legs dangling out the side of the Black Hawk like a veteran operator. Jones must have felt the weight of Kemper's gaze because the spook turned to look at him. He had his NVGs pushed up on his helmet, so Kemper could see the man's eyes. In the stark, high-contrast monochrome of night vision, Jones seemed relaxed and confident, almost bored. I wonder if Jones was an operator before he became a Jones. Kemper, a voice said in his headset, just as he felt the helo flaring above the desert floor, the entire thirteen-minute trip gone in a blink. Kemper turned and saw Perry miming that he lift the left ear cup of his headphones. Be sure to keep an eye on Romeo tonight, the NCO said without keying his mic. Kemper raised an eyebrow, confused. Say again? I said keep a close eye on Romeo. The kid is more spun up than usual tonight, Perry said, his lower jaw jutting out. Roger that, senior. It wasn't like Perry to play the mother hen. The salty senior chief's trident must be tingling, Kemper thought. Three minutes later, they were on the ground, two kilometers south of the target compound. The other half of the Tier 1 strike team was being dropped equidistantly north of the target by a second bird. As their Black Hawk lifted off, the team spread out. Each SEAL took a knee and scanned a sector for threats across their rifle sights. Seconds later, the quiet Black Hawk nosed over, rose, and disappeared into the night, and they were alone. From the corner of his eye, Kemper saw Perry raise a hand, signaling the drop zone was clear. They rose in unison and began the short trek to the target. Perry led the team to a thinly spaced grove of palm trees, fifty meters from the target house. The trees were a gift, providing rare and valuable cover. al Qaim was a border town that had sprung up along the life-giving Euphrates River. Pushed farther south, and the Wild West became nothing but a wasteland. Even greenery as scant as this had been absent in the shithole they'd hit last night. Romeo had dubbed the place Mos Eisley after some town in a Star Wars movie. All afternoon, the kid had been annoying everyone in the barracks with his awful impression of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mos Eisley, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. What a dork Romeo is. Kemper smiled at the thought as he surveyed the target. A single-story brown stucco building. The house was large by Iraqi standards, probably 700 square feet. Kemper recalled a sketch of the interior he'd seen in the pre-op briefing. A rectangular floor plan with three rooms, a front vestibule, a small kitchen, and a large common room in the back. The compound had seen gunfights in the past. Huge chunks of wall had been blasted out of one corner, and the stucco around the windows was pocked with bullet holes. Heavy tarps hung over glassless window frames. Slivers of light escaped from the corners, bright enough to wash out his night vision. Squinting through his goggles, he shifted his gaze to the front of the house where three vehicles were parked. A white Toyota pickup truck, a small gray sedan with blown-out windows, and a 1990s vintage Mercedes, no doubt belonging to tonight's HVT, Mahmoud bin Jabbar. Left, came Perry's whisper over the wireless headset. Keeping his body perfectly still, Kemper glanced left. A large man, 
six feet tall, two hundred pounds, was striding toward them, an AK-47 slung at the hip. Kemper tensed, a predator waiting for prey to enter the kill zone. He slowed his breathing and played out kill options in his mind. The Iraqi was two meters away now, and Kemper could see the man's attention was focused on lighting the cigarette he carried in his left hand. He shuffled along the tree line, oblivious to the threat lurking in the tall grass. With his right hand, Kemper silently drew his sog knife from the scabbard secured to his kit. When the terrorist turned his back, Kemper rose into a crouch. The man took a drag on his cigarette while retrieving a mobile phone from a pocket with his free hand. Banking on his distraction, Kemper closed the gap in a heartbeat, wrapped his left arm around the terrorist's neck from behind. With his right hand, he drove the black blade into the space between the base of the jihadist's skull and the top of the first vertebra, severing the connection between brain and body. The big man jerked, then collapsed the instant Kemper withdrew the knife. He eased the limp body to the ground and dragged it backward into the cover of the palm trees where Perry and the others waited. He looked down at his fallen foe. The terrorist's face was awash with fear, his brain confused why the call for oxygen now went unheeded. His eyes, controlled by cranial nerves and not dependent on spinal cord connections, darted back and forth in panic. His mouth hung open in a limp, silent scream. Kemper left the body where it lay and scanned the compound for motion. Seeing none, he whispered into his mic, Clear. A click of acknowledgement came into his headset. Then he heard Perry. Choctaw variable, this is Choctaw actual, on time, on target. Choctaw, check, you're a go, came the call from Captain Jarvis on base. Perry used a double click of his transmit button to let Jarvis and the other officers back at the talk know he had heard and acknowledged the instruction. The NCO then signaled with his left hand. The four seals and the spook spread out silently in the brush, in preparation for converging on the compound. Choctaw 2, 1, all set. Perry radioed to the team on the north side of the compound. A double click came back. Go, Senior whispered into the mic. The two teams converged on the target building from opposite directions. Four men from the north, five from the south. Each man moved in a tactical crouch, leading with his M4. Kemper scanned for targets over his rifle, following the targeting dot from his PEC-4 infrared designator. The dot, visible only in night vision, glided over the structure, clearing the walls, door, corners, and roofline. Kemper had danced this dance so many times it was almost as if the little green dot had a mind of its own, searching for threats while Kemper only watched. Within ten paces of the compound, his olfactory sense kicked in. The smells here were familiar. Aromatic cooking spices, cigarette smoke, body odor, and an earthen scent he had never been able to identify, but that was prevalent in western Iraq. Just as he could no longer stomach the smell of oysters after a bad bout of food poisoning as a teenager, this cocktail of odors had a primal, overpowering effect on him. This was the smell of danger, the smell of violence, the smell of death. Kemper and the other operators fanned out as they drew closer drifting into tactical positions on both sides of the front door. He crouched low beneath a window obscured by a heavy wool blanket hanging on the inside. He glanced right and watched Special Operator First Class Sanders, Sandman to his teammates, attach a small explosive charge to the door frame beside the latch. Kemper knew a similar scene was unfolding in mirror image on the other side of the house, the only difference being that the North Side team would use a much larger breacher charge to blow a man-sized hole in the stucco wall. Roof is clear, a voice said in Kemper's headset. The voice belonged to the overflight drone operator, who was probably stationed thousands of miles away in an air-conditioned room drinking a cup of hot, fresh coffee. This person, whom Kemper imagined as a clean-shaven twenty-something Air Force nerd without a single scar on his soft, pale body, would go home after his shift. He might grab a burrito at Taco Bell, watch a baseball game, and then fall asleep on the sofa with ESPN Sports Center playing on his TV. No moon dust in his eyes, no risk of bodily harm, no blood on his hands. What a weird fucking world. A burst of laughter from inside the house broke the silence and Kemper tensed. My thermal shows three bodies clustered in the front room, seven in the back, said Thiel, who was leading the team on the north side of the compound. 
This information was helpful, but blooded seals knew better than to trust it as gospel. Perry looked at Sandman, who was ready and waiting, holding the remote detonator in his hand. Sandman met his gaze. Perry nodded, then flashed everyone the thumbs-up signal. Kemper pressed his back against the wall. As he turned his head away from the door, he tilted his NVGs up onto his helmet and squeezed his eyelids shut tight. A flash of light, the deep baritone, whump, and the acrid smell of sulfur left no doubt that Sandman's charge had just blasted a manhole-size opening in the door. Inside the house, someone shrieked in pain. Kemper spun to face the door, brought his rifle up, and followed Romeo through the gap and into the house. Romeo moved right, clearing right. Kemper moved left, clearing left. With the left corner clear, Kemper moved forward, drifting toward the left wall and opening the gap between himself and Romeo. Perry, Sandman, and Jones entered behind them and pushed forward into the gap. The vestibule was clear, except for a single body writhing on the floor. Kemper glanced down. The poor son of a bitch must have been reaching for the doorknob at the exact wrong time, because he was screaming and cradling a bloody stump where his right hand had once been. Kemper stepped onto the man's uninjured left forearm with his oakley boot, securing the threat, but leaving his weapon free to sweep. He felt someone move up beside him, and from the corner of his eye he saw Jones crouch down. The spook pressed a knee into the jihadist's chest while covering with his M4. I got him, Jones said. You're clear. Thanks, Kemper grunted. He moved forward toward the arched doorway leading to the larger room at the back of the house. He heard a double tap to his right, but kept his focus over his own rifle. Clear, Romeo called from his right. Clear, he answered and fell in behind Sandman and Perry, who were now leading into the archway. Allahu Akbar, screamed a voice from the other room. A single crack from an AK-47 followed, but was drowned out immediately by the chorus of pops as Perry and Sandman fired their Sopmod M4s in unison. Two down, the rest are moving back toward you, Perry said over the wireless to Thiel and the North Team Seals. Kemper heard a whump as Seals' breacher charge blew a hole in the back wall of the house. The explosion was followed immediately by the sounds of gunfire and shouting. Kemper advanced through the doorway into the back room. He sensed motion to his left and spun on his heel, but found only a swinging gray blanket hanging over a glassless window. He moved toward the window. Chunks of cheap cement and stucco sprayed the side of his face as AK-47 rounds peppered the building from somewhere outside. Choctaw, this is Ghost. You have three squirters just exited the west side of the house and moving west toward a tree line. The drone operator's voice was soft and calm in Kemper's ear, in stark contrast to the primal screams and gunfire erupting in the back room. Three and five, pursue the west side squirters came the order from Perry in a voice as calm and cool as the drone operator's. Kemper felt a hand slap him on the back. With me, Romeo said. Kemper did a 180 and followed Romeo back through the vestibule and out the front door, snapping his NVGs 